Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying... Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle, because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said... Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Well, where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You don't see many people putting salt in their beer nowadays. Not that there's anything wrong with salt on radishes or french fries, but man, not in the king of beers. Truth is, the only thing salt can do for Budweiser is make it salty. An unwise thing to do to the only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Unsalted Budweiser has become the most popular beer in the world. That's because in brewing Bud, the Budweiser brewmaster goes all the way for a taste, a smoothness, a drinkability you will find in no other beer at any price. And something else you can take without a grain of salt. The fact that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. (laughs) 
save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam Hand Mixer, the Schick Style Dryer, a Presto Pressure Cooker and Wearing Blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too, from the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember... It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... <clears throat> I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife, paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, oh, come on now, Dick. You kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's, it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Oh, what's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For, for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's $50. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Here's the $50 enough. Not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. Now... The shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's, it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my need. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? 
hinges. You see them? Here, on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... the inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... Well, it's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe enough room for your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. Bill! Bill! Are you in there? Just a minute. I'm opening the door. Lucy! What are you doing here? Are you all right? Is he still here? What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened. All the way over here, I was just worried about you and, and, and scared, but... But I came anyway, and now... Oh, Bill, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I... don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but... I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. Well, what will you live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand? I don't want hands touching me. They've been touching death all day. All right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Well, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not, but I heard it from the barber. Some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. Looks something like a carrying case for a, a, a bass fiddle. Yes, sir. It looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? <sighs> yes, sir. Something to do with this special order. I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh, I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset, she's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Now, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't. But Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. Oh, I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... 
Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and, and then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven. Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had. I've in seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. <laughs> that coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay $50? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here, I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. <laughs> When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your cold to contact. Do it better. Six or three or one. Please don't give me problems. I'm catching a common cold. <laughs> Sneezing, drips, congestion. Give your cold to contact. For up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms, you'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact. I know, the tiny time pills. Right. Both the others are things for aches and fever, and the liquid, something for coughs, not found in contact. Your cold, your choice. Sneezing, drips, congestion, I'll take the contact. You feel cold, to contact. Six or three or one. Take contact. Only as directed. What are those little bottles for? Uh, they're for a demonstration to show folks why Culligan soft water washes whiter and cleaner than hard water does with less soap. You gonna show them now? Well, it's better in person or on television. You can't see it on radio. You don't want to show them, huh? Well, sure I do. Look, folks, I'm putting one measure of soap in this Culligan soft water and over twice as much in our local hard water. Then I shake them up. And you see that? Ooh, the salt water's all sudsy. But look at the hard water. Part of the soap turned into soap scum that's almost impossible to rinse away. The same thing happens in your washer. Really? And you can't stop it? Well, sure you can. The first step toward getting whiter, cleaner washes is to call your Culligan man. All right. Hey, Culligan man. Good. Do you think our listeners will call their Culligan man? Oh, yes. I'm sure they saw the difference. Want to try Culligan soft water without buying? Now you can rent a Culligan water softener for as little as $5.50 a month. For complete details on how you can rent a Culligan, pick up your phone and say... Hey, Culligan man! I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, 
liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful, but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Now, we'll give him another half hour, and then we'll lock up. Uh, That won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin, and we don't know who. We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. He's our best worker. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those raps didn't come from the door. Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there... There's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Good. Good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, that's it, in the corner. Mm-hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. Well, the make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir, it's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. But you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it off. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers, if there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He he lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, I'll, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that, that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry! How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes. Around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Uh, Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. The locks never bothered spirit. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is, where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. Well, what's happened to the moon? Uh, a cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Here comes the moon right in. Here's the gate. Where did he go? He must have gone in. Gate's locked. Uh, Well, I have my key. You you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. 
Come on. Come on. Uh, no, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul as you're going is a person I, I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who could lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man ordering his own coffin. Very, very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg Bill, of close you. Close the gate. I beg you, Mr. Rogers, leave this to me and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. At this point, Bill Spindle stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The, the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now is his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward. But I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried, and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. <laughs> don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Well, uh, uh, Bill, Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. Oh, my head. It hurts. Where, Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh, it's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. Uh, See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from, but I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. 
I wish with all my heart that you were right. What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of it. I this. warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music. And I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside, the lid slammed shut and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please, open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly, there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. I can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, do we really have to go on? It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. It's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. Any harm has befallen him. I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? Well, we'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose, suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right, all right, I'll come with you. Oh, Lord, there he is, lying across that coffin, and, and so still. Is he, is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation. But I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. If you're on the verge of buying a new small car, buy a small Buick. Not just because we say so, but because of what I'm about to tell you. The three small Buicks, the Buick Skyhawk, the Buick Skylark, and the Buick Apollo are newly designed for 1975. Their styling is fresh. Their engineering is up to date. Each of these small Buicks is powered by a spirited new V6 engine, which delivers excellent gas mileage. Each of these small Buicks has steel-belted radial tires, which also help the gas mileage. Each of these small Buicks has a high-energy ignition system, spark plugs that last nearly four times longer than before, and they each have typically comfortable Buick interiors. There's one other reason for buying a small Buick. If you take delivery of a new Skyhawk by February 28, 1975, Buick will send you a check for $500. If you take delivery of a Skylark or Apollo by February 28, Buick will send you $200. So, if you're going to buy a small car, buy a small Buick. 
Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. But he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account, not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a 'er ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music... And my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young, Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the Prince of Darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you... So insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering, you'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time. When suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined, joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan. And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? 
your soul, nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now, I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? <laughs> There's one thing I know, darling. I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestors, girl. Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. But why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindle's family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm <laughs> stumped. <laughs> it's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, the date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. All right. I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if you've forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy... I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely, why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Yeah, I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Ah, then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in 10 $20, and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place. Remember, our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but that would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and, and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. 
Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one. How in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. <laughs> you mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's... Leave that. Uh, anything else? Lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music. The open coffin. What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jerry. You're not going to try to tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head. Well, it's, it's possible. Maybe, I don't but... believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that... Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me, let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah. It all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. All right. Ah, dear. <laughs> it's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. Ah! Right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. That's got it now. Now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I, I can't... You got it. Ah, Jerry was right. It's yes. a compartment. Well, is, is there anything in there? This. Money. A twenty-dollar bill. Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Oh, wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. <laughs> What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. What it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs, and he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts, and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. But, John, this is the only time we can call Wind Van Dingo at midnight. It's the only time he's able to hear the voice of mortal man. And the clock just struck. Listen. 
He's here. That's his voice. Shay, that's just an eagle way off. Listen. Will you go back to sleep? <laughs> Who's that? It sounds like Enoch Frazier. Enoch must be having a nightmare. Don't let him. Let me go. Let me go. Oh, Enoch does drink an awful lot. No, no it's when Dan Dingo, all right. No, don't. And justice is being done. I don't think Enoch's crimes were that serious. Well, he's quiet now. No, he's dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact. The 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of the Star Times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing. <laughs> It's just a book, Holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why? And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Susie. Susie, come here a minute, will you? Did you call me, Mr. Holliday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for box 13. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holliday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter come with this? Hmm, just the book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert and Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susie. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it 
by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of lightsome day gild but to flout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. Uh, there's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star time. Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holiday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what have we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. Oh, sure, I remember now. For ten... Ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert N. Chase mansion. Blaze, unnoticed until too late, spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. Uh-huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose? Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have. What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Know where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Oh, she's been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see Mona in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, Mac. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. <laughs> Oui, monsieur. Ah, free French or engaged. You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you will tell me... Oh, what... what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. But mademoiselle Chase, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. <laughs> oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot promise. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. <laughs> what do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who... who are you? Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday. Occupation. Fiction writer. And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It, it was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted will go anywhere, do anything. You Thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. That's right. Colette will show you Was there anything I... suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say, a hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the poems about Fair Melrose. 
I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that Taya took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remained standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. That's where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. And now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget. <laughs> you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get! Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Eh, what for? I've, I've got business there. You're lying. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Well, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh, Nice little cottage you've got here. What do you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? Eh, my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eaten up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. And that's where they brung him. And that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Yeah, straight up the canyon. Turn left at the top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a lighter night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> Maybe she's right, Holiday. Definitely no night for a picnic. And who said it's going to be a picnic? Anybody here? Hello? And the same to you with feathers on. Match holiday. Don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Mr. Chase? Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. You are listening to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. <laughs> a 
And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice Barrett's own voice you got there, Holiday. Kling. Inspector Kling. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl, caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Kling, I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry-go-round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Kling. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. What do you want here again, Mr. Holliday? More to the point. What do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What do you do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take your word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I... I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. What do you want to see him for? I've got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. Oh, the chases. Devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah, ah. There he is. Oh, no. Yeah, that's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you wanted to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. Good. Now, why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop, nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here, the trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in this? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said, come here, come on. 
Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Oh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase, that plaque, whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. Someone took it. Mr. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to... He can't... Mr. He... Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear Let me again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Oh, hello there. Hello, Holiday. Expect I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body. We found it. In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling, later. You know where to reach me. Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. <laughs> You, you saw my brother, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please, the piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case. No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. He what? Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... If it's a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose. Then the plaque would prove you were at Merrifield the night of the fire. Yes. But somebody... Somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. Were you? No, no, no! How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I picked. I couldn't stand it I any... I see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. <laughs> Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh, do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story's about a girl. An 18-year-old girl. That is, she was 18 ten years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase... Wild with a temper, bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents, mostly about the friends she had, the way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper after a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did, but the fire destroyed her home almost completely. 
It meant the death of her parents, and it made her brother a You're making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Maryfield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to Melrose. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no goodness, Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose, then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held a secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years, that fire's on your mind. Day after day, you have to live with the secret, wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same as the date of the fire. No, I tell you it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day, he saw that trophy case. Day after day, it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly, it's different. There's... There's something missing. He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What, what are you doing? Calling the police. It's for them now. I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything. Only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector. Blinken. They hated me, all of them. Okay, I well, hated them and you. I hate you. They're Look out. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Kling. Holiday. Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in a guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. With an original story by Frank Hart Tausig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production.
This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. M&J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. the night sky and lands near Miller's Pond. surroundings. Wise one, I beg forgiveness, but I feel I must voice my inner conflict about this mission. I believe the humans are an ill-mannered and very hostile race. Mm. Our presence on this planet will not be welcome. Mm, speak to me not of your inner conflicts, Belknap. You have spoken of nothing else since we have departed the home planet of Bornak. Observation is the key to learning and growing as a better race. You would do well to remember that. The ambassador is in agreement with me. Oh, yes, yes, wise one, yes. Oh, most assuredly. Oh, I have observed Earth television programs. Yes, I have received them by satellite waves. Oh, they seem to be a perfectly delightful race of humans. Mm. Yes, so friendly. Won't you be my neighbor? Y'all come back now, you hear? Oh, delightful creatures. Yes, most delightful. Mm, yes. Yes, your enthusiasm is appreciated, Ambassador, but uh, do try to control your eagerness. Perhaps we will make contact with the humans before we return to Bornak, but for now, our mission is to observe them, to study their habits and learn what motivates them mentally. Perhaps, instead, Wiseman, we could capture one of the humans mm. and take him aboard our ship. We could then uh, dissect the creature's brain. Mm, well, not foolish one. Have you not heard a thing that I have said? How could we ever possibly hope to gain the human's trust if we dissected one of their kind? Now, anger me not again, Belknap, I warn you. Hmm. Let us exit this vessel. I wish to explore the outside terrain. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. <laughs> we seem to have landed near a water reservoir of some sort. Yes, yes. it is surrounded by many trees. It, it, it is called a forest, wise one. Yes, the humans live in a forest as well, except that they make houses out of the trees and they call it a city. Wise one, wise one, look. It, it is one of our own kind. It is a Bornachian. Hmm. Yes, it possesses the same features as we do. The fur covering the body, the flat tail, the sharp teeth. 
It is eating the outer surface of that tree. If the tree is going to fall... <laughs> this is most peculiar. Attention, Bonakian. When did you arrive? Identify yourself. Wise one, wise one. I, I have identified the creature with the analyzer. Hmm? It is not a Bonakian. Hmm. It originates from this planet. It is called... A beaver. Beaver? Yes, yes. It, it has a very low intelligence. Mm. It cannot speak, you see. Mm. But this is most puzzling. Yes. I recall a human television program in which a small human child was referred to as the beaver. Mm. But he looks nothing like this creature. Mm. Beavers. Fascinating. Mm. And notice, Ambassador, how the beaver is constructing a crude dwelling from the limbs of that tree. Well, we will do the same and conceal our ship. We do not want to arouse suspicion. When the morning sun rises, Ambassador, you and Belknap will enter the city. You will observe the humans closely, but you will not make contact. I will inform you when it is time for that. It is fortunate that we so closely resemble these beaver creatures. Now you can make your observations, and, but without being detected as mm, visitors. <laughs> oh, that's a knee slapper. Yeah. Oh, Cecil, you ought to be bored for the samples, I oh, swear. Elmer. You, you mean to tell me you actually rid your motorcycle on a high school running track during the middle of a track meet? I sure did. Coach Abernathy turned about 20 shades of red and chased me all over the track waving that there uh, track baton at me. <laughs> oh, boy, that's precious. I, I'd have given my say, right foot to have seen say, that. Say, look there, Elmer. There's two beavers walking down Main Street on the hind legs. Uh, now, now, Cecil, beavers don't walk on two legs like that. They're, they're probably little and dressed up in costumes. Yeah. You know, mascots for the Biloxi Beaver oh, that's football right. team. Yeah. Hey. Hey, hey, little fella. Hey. Hey, good costume, boys. Yeah. <laughs> like the costume over there, fellas. Uh, what? Why are those wretched humans shouting at us? Hey, silence, Belknap. We are not to speak in the presence of the humans. And let us communicate with our minds. If the humans are to think we are beavers until we make contact with them. Very well, Ambassador. But I still believe this mission is foolish. Belknap, observe. That building with the words police station printed on the side of it. I know these words. The friendly policeman, his job to protect and serve two men in blue. Ambassador, you watch entirely too much human television. Oh, look, look, Mona. See the two humans in front of the building? The large one is the sheriff. He is a symbol of great authority. Yes. yes. And the undernourished human is the deputy. He carries a single bullet in his pocket. I do not understand a single word. Oh, 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 they are speaking. Oh, oh, I, I, I must get closer so that I may hear them. Uh, uh, approach with caution, Ambassador. Yes, 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 I understand, I understand. Dead, blame it. Doggone it, Roland. We got the only dead blame police station surrounded by potted daisies. <laughs> now, how are we going to be a symbol of menace to the underbelly of society with them things in front of the place? Well, Come sissified looking. Well, now, now, Sheriff, there ain't no reason why we can't pretty up the place a little bit. Hey, hey, say, Sheriff, you going to go to the town meeting tonight? Uh, Mayor says the local economy's in bad shape. Yeah. Potholes need filling. And we need to hire someone to sandblast that bird stuff off in the statue of Antonio Biloxi. Well, I know all about it, Roland. I don't know. I might make the meeting. What are you saying on that, them daisies, anyhow? Oh, 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 well, this here's called Pestaway. Yeah, it keeps the animals off the daisies. Yeah, it smells good to humans, but to an animal, it stinks to the high heavens. Oh, oh. Oh, good Lord, here comes Ernie Pottledinger. What's that weasley old hick want? You dead blame it, Sheriff. Uh, don't, don't it. I'm a tax-paying citizen and I want something done. What is it, Ernie? Them beavers are back again, Sheriff. Oh, Lord. Every knock need year, it's the same thing. Them river rats dam up Miller's Pond and uh, cut off the water, Sheriff Fly. Uh-huh. And I irrigate my crops with that water, Sheriff. I know, Ernie. And you're the only one that irrigates his crops with the Miller Pond water. Now, you want them beavers got rid of, you get rid of them yourself. Oh, well, you're leaving it to me, are you? Right. Is that what you're saying, or uh, has I misunderstood you? That's exactly what I'm saying, Ernie. Do it yourself. Oh, right, Dad Nabbit. I'll get some dynamite and blow them beaver dams in the toothpick. You do that, Ernie. 
Don't blow your head off while you're doing it. I'm telling you, it's a sorry world we're living in. We can't depend on the dead blame. Can you, can you feature that guy, Rose? <laughs> yeah, he, he does like to flap his gums on his hair. That's another if statement. Flap gums, speak of the devil. There's a beaver right there. Huh? I sure don't want them mangy things around here. I'll give him a dose of this here pestle. Well, now, now, hold on, Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah take, take that, you river weasel. Yeah, yeah, that game going. No. Well, yeah, Rolling, that was kind of cruel. I, I never seen a beaver walk on two legs like that before. Bill, no, Bill, no. The human attacked me with a thousand men through it. The human attacked you. Yeah. It is just as I have always said. The humans are tyrants, all of them, attacking you without provocation. I am going to vaporize that human with a proton ray. No, 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 Belknap. No violence, no violence. Let us return to our ship. I wish to remove this foul-smelling fluid from my fur. Very well. We will return to the ship, and I will inform the wise one what has happened here. Perhaps then he will agree that these humans should be dissected. I'm telling you, Rex, if I never oh. fit eyes on another one of them book two black tailed river weasels, it'll be right now too soon. Well, let's complain. Blame me. Oh, come on, this complaining's gone on long enough. You gotta watch those arteries of yours. You're gonna bust one of them if you keep this up. Well, I know it, Rex, but it just sets my blood to boiling. Ernie, mm -hmm. well, what are these beavers gonna do when they don't have no home to go to, huh? Well, I don't give a flying flip what they do, Rex. All I'm interested in is blowing them beaver damn sky high. Dad, blame it. I don't care if they go to Mars and live. Mm -hmm. Contain your anger, Belknap. Uh. You say the deputy human attacked the ambassador with a fluid? Yes, wise one. What sort of fluid, ambassador? <laughs> Were you harmed? <laughs> no, wise one, no. I was not harmed. The fluid had an overwhelming stench. Oh, yes, an odor most foul, yes. Mm. But I submerged myself in the pond and washed the fluid off. Mm. Yes, the smell is gone now, yes. Mm. Yes. Yes, the smell is... For the most part, gone. Wise one, are you not enraged by what the human has done? Mm. The ambassador did nothing to provoke the attack. Mm. This is true? Mm. You, you did not speak to the human ambassador? Oh, no, 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 wise one. I did exactly as you instructed, yes. I, I really observed the earth beings. Perhaps I got a little too close. Yes, but your plan worked, wise one. The humans thought we were beavers, yes. Perhaps beavers are considered pests by the humans. Hmm. Yes, that is logical. If that is the case, the deputy sprayed you with a fluid to repel you, Ambassador. Oh. Well, it, it most assuredly repelled me. Yes, wise one, yes. Mm, yes, yes. It is obvious to me that beavers are unwelcomed in the city. Mm. That is unfortunate. How can we observe humans if we cannot enter the city? <laughs> perhaps, wise one, perhaps it is time to reveal ourselves to the humans, mm. to communicate with them verbally. Mm. Yes, perhaps it is time to make contact, Ambassador. B but, wise one, if the humans dislike beavers, mm. imagine what they will do when they discover that we are from another planet. Mm. There is no logic in what you are saying, Belknap. There is a vast difference between an aquatic, unintelligent beast and a an highly advanced race of intelligent beings. Yes. The humans will greet us with kindness when we tell them who we are. Oh, yes, yes, they certainly will. Oh, yes, remember the movie, the human movie, that yeah. inspired us to visit the planet Earth? Oh. Those five lovely notes? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, not this again. This is foolish. <laughs> You blowed that beaver dam in the splinter. Yes, look, look at look at there. There's something sitting right there. Huh? Well, what oh, would you look at that? It's some sort of rectangular metal object. It, it was sitting underneath that beaver dam. Say, say, Rick. Yeah. Wonder, Rick, and how much the scrap yarn to give us for this? Hey, Ernie, don't be such a backwoods hick. Oh, hey, goodness, that looks like a spaceship, some kind of UFO or something. Here, Rick. I'm going to Sheriff McElroy right now. Oh, the sheriff. All right, Dad, blame it. But if the Gazette writes a story about this, we get full credit. 
What damage has our ship sustained, Ambassador? Uh, only structural damage, wise one. It can be repaired. That was the final blow. The humans tried to destroy our ship with explosives. Tyrants. No, no, Belknap. The humans thought it was a beaver dam. You heard them. Yes, I heard them. They have discovered our ship and they are going to inform the sheriff. You are correct, wise one. Now is the time to make contact with the humans. Mm. But it will be my way. Mm. It is time you both learned that this is not the friendly blue planet you envision. It is a planet of wars and social disorder. Mm. You see why you were watching the sitcoms. I was watching the news. Mm, the news? Yes. What are you planning to do, Belknap? I will return to the police headquarters and take human prisoners. Mm. I will decide later what to do with them. And you intend to do this alone? No. Not alone. I am going to contact the home planet of Bornek. I warn you, wise one. Do not speak or contradict what I'm about to say. I would regret having to use this weapon. Attention! Bornekian headquarters. This is Belknop reporting from the planet Earth. The humans have attacked us. The wise one is ill, and I have taken command. Our mission has changed. I will capture human prisoners to be punished for violent actions against us. Send others to aid and capture. Land at coordinates Psi, Lithu, Rolai. That is all. Mm, you lied to them, Belknap. Bornak is a peaceful race. You are ruining everything. It is done, wise one. There is nothing you can do to stop my mission now. Mm, oh, no. I will warn them before they arrive. I will tell them that you lied to them. <laughs> You will not, wise one, with the communicator destroyed. Now, I must go. The others will begin arriving soon, and I have important matters to attend to. I warn you, do not follow me. Oh, oh, this is terrible, wise one, just mm. terrible. What will we do now? Mm. I know not, Ambassador. At this moment, I do not feel wise at all. Dad, go I'm late for work again. Sheriff's gonna have my badge for breakfast. Ah, the deputy is getting into his automobile. Well, he's going to have an unexpected passenger. Uh, th th this is Deputy Roland checking in. Th there's no need to break out the bloodhound, Sheriff. I'm on my way. I, I... Dad, go in my rearview mirror. There's a beaver in my back seat. Continue on your present course, human, or I will melt your brain with a proton ray. A, a talking beaver. I am not a beaver. I am a superior being that merely resembles a beaver. Me and Rex seen it with her own eyes, Sheriff. It was uh, about a ten feet long metal box looking thing, and it was sitting right there in the pond just as pretty as you please. And quite cleverly disguised as a beaver dam, I might add. Uh-huh. Well, all right, boys, quick as Roland decides to drag his lazy hand into work, we'll go down there and check it out, all right? Already five minutes late. I'm going to eat his fast for breakfast as quick as he can. Huh. What in the Sam Hill is making all that racket outside? Oh, oh my eyes out. Sheriff, look out the window. There's, there's these things coming out of the sky. Then I'll be hard swoggled if they don't look exactly like that metal gizmo we found at the park. Uh, I was right. They are spaceships. Spaceships? Well, now, come on, boys, get a grip. Uh, it's probably some sort of fraternity hazing stunt or something. Well, there ain't a college town around for a hundred miles, Sheriff. And I'll be a bug-eyed, stammering fool. Them beavers coming out of them spaceships. Beavers? Well, now, there's just so much silliness I can take. Uh, here comes Roland in the squad car. I, I bound you this is all his doing. First it's potted daisies and now this. Well, now here's a new twist on things, Sheriff. There's another beaver getting out of that squad car with the deputy. It seems to be holding some kind of pistol to his well, head. I bet you that's a death ray. Death ray? You boys still believe in Santa Claus, don't you? Uh, uh, all right, I'm walking, I'm walking. Roland? Uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm late, Sheriff. Uh. I, I got held up. Literally. Now, 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 put your spindly arms down, Roland, and tell your honor Rodge to move it along, would you? 
I mean, fun's fun, but we can't have a bunch of pygmies dressed up in costumes loitering outside the station. It ain't no joke, Sheriff. This look you see on my face is genuine stark terror. The deputy speaks the truth. I am Belknap of the planet Bornak. Planet? Space beaver? I am not a beaver. I will vaporize the next human that says that. I am here to take prisoners to be dissected. Uh, the deputy comes with me. Uh, he has attacked my brother, the ambassador. I tell you, it was an accident. I thought he was a beat. You know, silence. And both of you will come with me as well. well you, you mean Rex and Ernie? Yes. They attempted to destroy our transport vessel with explosives. Well, now, flag on that play. Ain't no galaxy hopping woodchuck <laughs> gonna dissect Ernie Pottle, dang well, Ain't nobody gonna dissect nobody. Now, listen, little buddy, if this is a joke, it ain't funny. And if it ain't a joke, well, it seems to me you're getting all lathered up over a simple misunderstanding. Now, like it or not, you look just like a beaver, and all this stuff that's happened has happened because you were mistook for beavers. Now, why don't you just simmer down and uh, let's discuss this thing civil life? I warn you, Sheriff. This building is surrounded by Bornakians. Uh -huh. They will come to my aid if I call for them. Well, now, you just call them off and hand me that ray gun. Uh, you dare to advance upon me, you wretched human. Very well, Sheriff. You desire immediate death, then I will comply with your wishes. No, no, don't shoot the Sheriff. Oh, my God. Oh, oh. 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 oh heck. Heck, that don't hurt at all. What? No, Sheriff. It's kind of tingly. I, it feels kind of good, you won't know the truth. I, I do not understand. It it must be your genetic structure. The, the beam is not powerful enough to penetrate human flesh. Well, now, that's just a screaming pity, ain't it, little fella? What? It's uh, my duty to inform you that attacking a, uh, a peace officer is a federal offense. Uh, and I'm going to have to incarcerate you uh, until we can get to the bottom of it. Uh, uh, unhand me, Earth creature. I warn you. Oh, so I'm warning you, Buck-Tooth Rogers. Get into that cage. Uh, uh, assistance! Help me, my brothers. Attack them. Attack. Uh oh, Sheriff, Sheriff. Them aliens outside are getting stirred up. They're trying to break down the door. They're leaving the beavers to start a riot. Uh, now, now they're trying to chew through the door, Sheriff. I told you we need to let on. Well, don't stand there spinning your pivot too. Roll them. Think of something. Uh, then do it quick. What's going through the window? Uh, uh, hold on a second. I got a can of that dressed away stuff in my desk drawer. That ought to hold them back. Uh, here it is. Take that, you saving rat. Uh, uh, it's working, Rose. They look alive. What's coming through the hole in the door? I got it, Jerry. Well, there's three of them coming in through the stove pipe. I got it back right there. Well, this is getting my dog with me. Yeah, I got an idea, y'all. Yeah. Ernie, yeah. you have to count of three. Open up that door. All right. When them fever aliens start rushing in, rolling, you hit them with that pasture away. Then, Rex, yeah. you and me will hurt them into the cave. All right. Y'all ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Open the door. Yeah. 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 That's the time rolling. All right, Rex. Get him into the cage. Turn him in there. Get in there. Get into that cage. Come on, now. Get in there. That's the way. There we go. We did it, boy. We got up a tail full of fever aliens. We're going to be the laughing stock of the police ball when they catch wind of this. Hang on, Sheriff. Here comes two more of them. All right. Do I have to spray you? You got to come along peacefully. Oh, no. No, not the floor again. Please. Please allow me to speak. I am the wise one of the planet Bornak, and this is my assistant, the ambassador. Huh? We come in peace. You come in peace? Well, you sure got to kill your way of showing it. Your compadres here have been downright antisocial. Oh, oh dear. Have I arrived too late? Have humans been killed? Well, no. Nobody's dead. One of them tried to use a ray gun, but it didn't even raise a blister. Wise one. Wise one. The humans have imprisoned us. Mm, you deserve a fate much worse, Belknap. Uh, you attempted to exterminate a human. Wise one, I... I shot the sheriff. I did not shoot the deputy. Mm, and you are still alive to speak of it, Belknap. These humans have shown you immeasurable mercy. Mm, tell me, who is the tyrant now? Uh, perhaps, wise one, perhaps I have reacted foolishly. Perhaps! Mm, you disappoint me greatly, my brothers. I beg forgiveness, Sheriff. 
I lost control of my command. Yes, yes, we are normally a very peaceful race. Yes, very friendly, just just like your favorite Martian and that funny creature from Orc. Mm, yes, our desire was to learn from the human race. We find you immensely fascinating, but now our mission has been ruined. Sheriff, if you would release my brothers from imprisonment, I will see that they are properly punished for their actions, well, and we will never return to this planet again. Well, now, hold the phone, boys. I don't think that's necessary. Now, the way I see it, this has all been just a big misunderstanding. And Lord, that happens all the time here on Earth. Started two wars because of misunderstandings. No, I, I, I got an idea. I was sitting here studying while all this was going on, and, well... We need some funds for our community real bad. And you folks want to study humans. I think maybe we can work something out. Two weeks later, a ribbon-cutting ceremony was about to take place. All right, boys, you understand what you're supposed to do now, don't you? Mm, yes, Sheriff. We are to pretend we are beavers when the humans come to stare at us. Oh, we are going to pretend. What fun? That's right. Between the hours of 12 and 4, you Bornakians become beavers. Now, there'll be people coming from all over to see beavers in action. So put on a good show for them, all right, boys? And while they're staring at you, well, you can observe them. Study their habits and their languages and such. This is what we humans call teamwork. We both benefit, you see. Mm, how wise you are, Sheriff. Oh, I just live clean, that's all. All right, boys, here they come. All right, remember now, don't talk. Beavers don't ordinarily converse. Hello, everybody. I thank you all for turning out for this special occasion. Hey, I'm Sheriff McRoy of the Biloxi Police Department, and it makes us darn proud to give you vacationing out-of-towners a chance to see a genuine beaver in their natural habitat. And now, by cutting this here ribbon, I declare the Biloxi Beaver Sanctuary, formerly Miller's Pond, open for business. Mm, do you still believe these humans are tyrants, Belknap? No, wise man. I no longer believe everything I see on the news. Mm, but they are rather silly. Mm, the humans are here. Observe, Belknap, observe. Well, now, that was a pleasant story, wasn't it? Yes, I, I so enjoy when things work out in the end. Yes, unfortunately, things are not so good here. The water level is quite high now, and unlike a beaver, I'm not very aquatic. Yes, I'm afraid you should leave and return under drier conditions. Until next time, pleasant dreams. You have just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Today's installment, Biloxi and the Bogus Beavers of Bornak. For correspondence, send to MJ Audio Theater, P.O. Box 252. Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities with actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. A production by M&J Audio Theater. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. 
Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them and they said yes, so now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In today's adventure, the swastika on the windmill, the role of Paul Halfand, an OSS agent in Holland, is played by Les Tremaine. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. My mouth was as dry as ashes. The palms of my hands were wringing wet. My revolver was drawn, and I moved slowly, slowly along the dark hall. Everything I had been taught led up to this, this moment. Boards under my feet teetered. For a terrifying moment, I almost lost my balance and fell backwards. Something was ahead of me, in a room along that dark passage. I sensed it more than anything else. And then I heard it. I stopped breathing until I passed that room and the voices of the hidden Germans almost slid past them to the end of the corridor. Halt! Halt, There was a Nazi stormtrooper in uniform right in front of me, blocking the exit. Well, fire! Fire! Fire again! Good work, Paul. Well, that's it. You passed the test. Now the colonel wants to see you. What I had just come through was a cleverly designed scare house that rivaled any Coney Island chamber of horrors for one-a-minute thrills. This was part of the training of an OSS agent, and it took place less than an hour's ride from Washington, D.C. Lieutenant Howe found at the present time we have no information, and no way of getting information, on the disposition and plans of German troops in the Netherlands. We think they're up to something. We want to know what. Now, you'll be flown to England... And from there, a submarine will take you to the coast of Holland. The coast of Holland? To me, Holland was that little country where my Uncle Brom lived, where I visited when I was 12, where the windmills were now under the shadow of the swastika. I guess we can surface about here. There's Mac on Holland. You want to take a look, Lieutenant Helfen? Oh, thanks, Commander Smurling. Through the periscope of the submarine tuna, I could see a windmill in the flat lowland of the Netherlands. I couldn't see the swastika, but I knew it was there. The pressure gauge showed 20 feet of salt water above us. Take her up! Take her up! Surface. Open the hatch. We climbed the ladder through the hatch where an inflated rubber boat was waiting to take me to shore. I'm only a couple of yards from shore. I can get out here. <clears throat> Hand me that rucksack, please. Here you are, sir. Have you far to go from here? It's only about five miles from Makum to Bolsward, where my uncle lives. I can make it before the sun comes up. 
Goodbye. And thanks. Good luck. Good luck, sir. So when you rang the bell at Santa Paul, I jumped from my bed. The devil, I said. It's the Gestapo. <laughs> they finally put two and two together and connected me with the underground. Hush, Bram, hush. God gave you a tongue. Must you use it so loosely? I'm afraid my new Aunt Hilda doesn't trust me completely. I trust no one these days. Oh, Hilda, Hilda, this is Paul. <laughs> how often have I spoken to you of the times he came here when he was... <laughs> how old, Paul? Twelve, Uncle Brown. Ah, oh, yes, twelve. <laughs> and so proper, so correct. <laughs> a miniature model of propriety. <laughs> well, from the looks of it, you've grown, but you haven't changed much. Still proper as the devil. <laughs> <laughs> the result of my strict Quaker upbringing, Uncle Brown, remember? Uh, we were both taught never to drink or smoke or lie or or swear, Uncle Brom. Uh, yes. <clears throat> How long will you stay in Holland? Only long enough to contact the leader of the underground and get the information I'm after. I see. Tell me, why should we believe that you are an allied spy? Hilda! Answer me. Surely you don't expect me to carry proof about me that I'm a spy in case the Germans find me? Then how do we know? That's enough, Hilda. The devil, I say. I'll hear no more of this talk. All right, Brown. It will be as you say. And on your conscience. Your, your wife doesn't trust me. You were surprised, no doubt, to find your Aunt Katrina dead and... I remarried. Yes, yes, I was, Uncle Brom. I was lonesome. It's not good for a man to live by himself. And she is a good woman. But she doesn't trust me. She has her reasons. There was a man in these parts not long ago. He passed himself off as a British agent, gained the confidence of some of the underground. Then he turned them over to the Gestapo. Oh, I see. Hilda's family was among those executed. You understand now? Uncle Brom, you haven't seen me nor heard from me since I was a boy. You don't know where I've been during those years in between. You don't know what my loyalties are. Do you trust me? Tomorrow I will take steps to put you in contact with Hans Bock in Luaden, the leader of the Dutch underground. When I awoke a few hours later, it was about ten o'clock. Through the window of the spare room that Aunt Hilda had made up for me, I could see the neat little milk carts jolting over the Keistin and uh, cobblestones. And I could see the endless stream of bicycles. And here and there, a German soldier in uniform, like a blot on the landscape. I'm afraid the breakfast is not as sumptuous as it was in the old days, Paul. Do not apologize for what we cannot change. Um, Aunt Hilda is right. It was very good. The Rogerbrood was just as I remembered it. And these current buns, these Krentenbruges, uh, are wonderful. Hmm. I will leave you. I have a house to clean. You're still suspicious of me? Have I any reason not to be? Hilda, enough! Paul is my sister's son. I will stake my own life's blood that he is to be trusted. Let us hope you do not have to. Hilda! Aunt Hilda. Look. This pistol. I'm giving it to you. It's the only one I have. The only one you have? And you give it to me? Yeah. I put myself at your mercy. If at any time you have proof, even the slightest, that I'm not what I claim to be, take my own gun and turn it on me. I will take your gun and take you at your word. That should convince her, Paul, you are what you say. Mm, I hope so. Now, what about this Hans Buck? How can I get in touch with him? I will arrange for a meeting between you halfway at the Harlingen, uh, five days from now, to give him time to collect the information you are after. <laughs> 
The days until Thursday, when I was supposed to meet Hansbach, passed slowly. But they weren't wasted. I set up the shortwave radio in the wine cellarette in the living room. I had long talks with Uncle Brum. And I went out of my way to win over Aunt Hilda. Are you sure there's nothing I can do to help you with dinner, Aunt Hilda? Nothing. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's... uh... Uh, It's still raining. One need not be too clever to see that. Uh, In Holland, it seems always to be raining now. Rain, mud, and despair. I remember when I came here years ago. It was winter. I was in time for the skaters' races. Yeah. Skaters' races. And the booths. Remember the little booths that sold chocolate and milk cooked with aniseed? And the little cakes, all the varieties of gingerbread? Oh, how I loved them. Hand me the spoon. Uh, Here. Here you are. Thank you. Tell me about America. What is it like? Well, it's too large to describe in a sentence or two, Aunt Hilda. When the war is over, you must come visit us. Hmm. When the war is over. (sighs) Well, it it can't last forever. And America is helping. And remember, our leader, President Roosevelt, is himself of Dutch ancestry. Tomorrow... Tomorrow, perhaps, I will make you a gingerbread cake. Yes, I won her over slowly. And on Thursday, when I left for Harlingen, she said goodbye to me at the door with Uncle Brom. You know where to meet him, Paul. You have everything clear? Yeah, everything, Uncle Brom. I'm to meet him beside the monument of the stone man on the North Sea dikes. I'll be knotting and unknotting a piece of string so he'll know me. Good, good. We will uh, see you later tonight, then? Yeah. Paul? (coughs) Here. This is for you. In case you should have need of it. My pistol. Take it back. Thank you. Thank you, Aunt Hilda. Good morning. Good morning. This habit you have of knotting and unknotting string, is it not a waste of time? Nothing is a waste if it serves a purpose. Herr Buck? Yeah, Lieutenant Alfond. We meet his friend. The information. Do you have it? Yeah. Where? Where? In my head. You will have to memorize it as I give it to you. I could not take a chance of writing anything down. I'll remember then. Remember it and use it well. There are 40,000 Nazi troops in Holland and Belgium. But these troops will be on the move within two weeks. Where are they going? Northern Italy. They will be used to cut off the American advance there. The colonel did suspect the worst. Thank you. Thank you. I'll radio this out tonight. It is appropriate, is it not, for us to meet under the statue of this stone man? Hmm. See the inscription? Uh, Terminus. It means thus far and no farther. A threat to the sea that is held back by the dikes. Thus far and no farther. A threat also to the Nazis? Yeah. You understand me well. Remember me to your uncle, and goodbye for now. Herr Bock is in constant danger of discovery by the Gestapo, Paul. That's why he could not take a chance and write that information down for you. It wasn't necessary, Uncle Brom. He passed it from his head to mine. When will you radio it to London? It's after midnight. I think I can start now. What's that? A car stopping in front of the house. 
There are two men getting out. So late? Who are they, Brown? Do you know them? No, I don't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid it was like this once before when they came to get my family. Uh, Paul, we were turned in then by someone who pretended to be a friend. Hilda. Aunt Hilda, do you believe I don't know. I... I don't know what to believe. I'll answer it. Mr. Kelderman. Yeah? We have business with you. Come in. This is my wife and my nephew, Paul Halfond. Your nephew? <laughs> Max, take a good look at him. Huh? Would you say he looks as if he's to be trusted? I never trust the man who looks so innocent. What are you talking about? Who are you? Do not be so suspicious. We are from Hans Bock. We're members of the underground. Underground? I was not conscious there was an underground in the Netherlands. What do you want with us? Ah, you're being very careful. I can see that, Herr Kelderman, and that's good. And but perhaps this will prove who we are. Would you not say that is Herr Bock's own signature? Yeah, that is his all right. Mm -hmm. I know it well. You're convinced now. Read it aloud, Uncle Brown. Let me read it, Paul. Have reason to distrust man you sent me today. Show proof who he is or turn him over to these men for underground execution. But this is ridiculous. I do not understand. Nor I. Herr Bock seemed to trust me well enough this afternoon. Your nephew is a German spy, a traitor in our midst. The devil he is. I do not believe that. Not Paul. He's not a spy. Not for the Germans. You want proof? I will give you proof. Uh, see here, in the wine cellar. Uh, this is his shortwave radio. He was going to send a message tonight. He is a friend. He is an ally. He is a member of the American OSS. Uh, don't you believe me? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is the matter? We will leave you well enough. Thank you for giving us proof of what we suspected. What's this? Shall I show them my badge, Herr Commander? Do that, Sergeant. Do that. Take a good look. The skull and crossbones. The Gestapo. We've been trailing Herr Bock, but we had no definite proof that he was connected with the underground. We only suspected. And today we saw him meet your... Navio here on the North Sea dikes. Why did you wait until we now? We figured to... that if we arrested them then and there, we might get nothing from them. So we waited. We arrested Herr Bock, and we found a paper with his signature on it. That note you showed us was forged. Quite right, Frau Kelderman. The note was forged. Herr little Bock by little. Tell us anything. Inch by now inch. Can no longer I have made my way to the yet. kitchen door. You have killed him. Right again. And, and then around the corner. To your husband for supplying us and up the, the back stairs. Yes, Commander. Yes, Captain. After him. Halt! Run, Paul! The attic! Halt! I will go west with you! In a flood of memory, it came back. Chamber of horrors, an hour's drive from Washington. My mouth was dry as ashes, but the palms of my hands were wringing wet. Along the dark hall, my revolver drawn. Everything I had been taught led up to this. This moment. We have you covered from both sides. Drop your gun! Well, fire! Fire! Fire again! Into the darkness! But this time there was no instructor to say good work, Paul. There was just a gun in my back and a leader of the Gestapo to say... You are under arrest, Lieutenant Harlfond. How long do you think you can hold out? We have ways of making you talk. No, no. Must we convince you more... Sergeant. Yeah, Herr Commander. Yeah. Well? Eh, perhaps we'll have better luck if we question your aunt. Sergeant, get Frau Kelderman. Bring her here. No, no, no. Don't do that. Let her alone. Simply because you request it? Sergeant, do as I say. We'll see how long she holds out. If she's obstinate, we'll have a shot, and you will be a witness, Lieutenant. <laughs> You find this amusing, Lieutenant Halfhorn? <laughs> well, I know when I'm beaten. Don't bother the old lady or the old man either. What are you saying? Well, I, I thought I could hold out. I can see now there's no point in holding out. You've won. What more is there to say? If you're just stalling for time... I'm not stalling, Herr Commander. I'll prove it. I'll confess everything. Tell you everything you want to know. Now you're becoming smart. And so I told them. Everything they wanted to know. 
General Donovan heads the OSS in Washington. The OSS is part of the American State Department. The Minister of Finance in Britain is also head of the British Secret Intelligence. Go ahead, Lieutenant Halfond. We're listening. Corporal, take this down. I gave them a mixture of fact and fantasy that would have done the German propaganda ministry proud. The true facts I told them I knew they already knew. The rest they seemed to accept at face value. So I kept my story with a real whopper. You taking all this down, Corporal? We'll take this down with a red pencil. An invasion of North Holland is part of the Allied plan. What? The invasion will be made in the eastern area of Friesland on the Dutch North Sea coast. You are lying to us! You... <clears throat> we'll see if you know you are beaten. <laughs> Perhaps you've been on the wrong side, Lieutenant Hartfound. You've uh, set up a radio? I think you ought to use it. Tonight. Time is now 2300. 2300. Paul Halfond calling headquarters. Can you hear me? Over. OSS headquarters to Paul Halfond. You're coming in clear. Been waiting for your message, Paul. Good to hear your voice. What Over. did you say? There's a gun in your back. <laughs> I can see it's going to take a lot to convince you. Paul Hall found a headquarters. Listen. Listen carefully. It's stinking weather for a drop, but I've got to have supplies. It's darned important. Over. Headquarters to Hall Fund. Would you mind repeating that so we're sure? Repeat, please. Over. What the devil's the matter? You said you were getting darn good reception. I said the weather's lousy, but it's darned important that I get a supply drop at designated point tomorrow night. Can't make it any darn clearer than that. Over. Okay. Okay, Paul. We get it. It's darn clear now. You'll get your supply drop. Good night. Over and out. Huh? You heard it yourself. The drop will be made. Are you beginning to be convinced of my sincerity? Were you nervous, Lieutenant? What? Why do you say that? I never heard you use such language before. Oh, I, uh, I expect to get over my nervousness after I broadcast many of these radio messages for you, Commander Brandt. After that, they drove me back to the jail. Commander Brandt of the Gestapo had never heard me use such language before, and neither had OSS headquarters. <laughs> In the Army, they used to make fun of me because of my proper speech. I gambled on the chance that the radio operator who knew me would detect something odd about my speech. When he answered back the same way, I knew he understood I was a prisoner of the Germans and that the supply drop would probably save my neck. I didn't sleep that night, and I didn't really take a deep breath until 11 o'clock the next morning. Good morning, Lieutenant. Would you care, perhaps, for a piece of chocolate? An American cigarette. I knew the drop had been successful. They sent us home. Uncle Brom, Aunt Hilda, and me. But we brought a boarder with us in the person of Commander Brandt. House was different now. Aunt Hilda prepared meals silently. Uncle Brom smoked his pipe and looked at me. Wondering, And twice a week they sat in the living room and watched and listened as Commander Brandt and I contacted OSS headquarters. OSS headquarters to Paul Halvin. This is important. Four and twenty blackbirds are coming through the rye. Storm clouds overhead. Take in your washing. Good night. Over and out. What did that mean? 15,000 more Allied troops are added to preparations for the invasion of Holland. <laughs> and then we will rush 20,000 more German troops to the Dutch North Sea coast. Already we have 40,000 troops waiting there. We were going to send them to... Uh, elsewhere. But they would undoubtedly be of more use here. Undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, I'm going up to bed now. Dog shit. The dinner was very good, Frau Kelderman. I cannot help being a good cook. 
Yes. Well, good night. It's thoughtful of him to leave us alone so much. Is it? I do not care much for your company. Hilda, maybe he's got his reasons. I wanted to tell them my reasons, but I didn't dare. Instead, I stood at the piano and played the scale with one finger. Even Uncle Brom was getting to the point where he couldn't look me straight in the eye. But as Uncle Brom became more suspicious, Commander Brandt became less suspicious. I think I will go up to bed, too. Something was wrong with the piano. The C was sharp, as if something were pressing on it, making it sharp. I walked around to the back of the baby grand, and I saw it. It was a small, round disc the size of an overcoat button. I knew it was attached to a dictaphone in Brandt's room. That was why he left us alone so much. I'd give him something to listen to. Paul, I know there must be some explanations for these things you are doing. Now, look. You haven't had it so good for years. Eggs on the table. When did you have eggs on the table last? Privileges nobody else has. Extra ration books. You might as well face it. This is a new order. Germany's order. And if you're smart like I am, you'll fall in with them. Paul, Paul, is this you? I told you he was a traitor, a spy. I warned you. You wanted to see me, Herr Commander? Yeah, Paul. Uh, thank you for coming to my office so promptly at my call. I follow orders, so I'm beginning to see. Uh, sit down, sit down. I want you to hear something. I think I'll go up to bed, well, too. I don't understand. Simple. A dictaphone. But I still don't... Oh, I know there must be some what? explanation... That's Uncle Brom. Yeah. Quiet. Now, look... You haven't had it so good for years. That's me. Eggs on the yeah. table. Well, what's the <laughs> idea of doing it on the table last? Privileges nobody else has. Extra <laughs> ration books. You might as well face it. This is a new uh, order. Germany. You've convinced me completely. If you're smart like I am, you'll Paul, fall in with them. I have a proposition for you. Yes? I want you to go to England for us. Act as a double agent. You can be more valuable to us there. Leave Holland? Yeah. But aren't I a great help to you here? I know the risk it involves. But Germany will pay you well after the war. Think it over. I thought it over and let him convince me. And a few days later, a German stormtrooper gave me a personal escort to the border. And I made my way back from the enemy lines. After I left... My aunt and uncle escaped and were hidden by the underground. And it wasn't until the war was over that I was able to see them and explain. Lieutenant Paul Holfand returned to OSS headquarters. And thousands of Nazi troops waited on the shore of the North Sea for an invasion that never came. Thus, once again, the report of another OSS agent closed with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Paul Alfond was Les Tremaine. Brahm was played by Stefan Schnabel, Hilda by Virginia Payne, Vant by Barry Kroger, the Colonel by Raymond Edward Johnson. Others were Carl Weber, Jerry Jarrett, Arnold Robertson, and Bob Weil. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of Murray Ross. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander and was under the direction of Sherman Marks. Programs, get your programs here. 
Mystery fans, there's an exciting evening waiting for you tonight on NBC. First, some listener will have a chance to win a double reward for solving the case on $1,000 reward. Next, when a woman reads her own obituary in the paper, the saint finds himself involved in a case that leads to murder. Then Sam Spade works his way through the rod and reel caper. Yes, you'll find adventure here tonight. Stay tuned now for High Adventure and the Big Guy on NBC. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Silter King Cigarettes Take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the Creaking Door. The Creaking Door is... So do come in. Mark you, it's no place to come if you want to live it up a little. As a matter of fact, it's rather a dead end. <laughs> in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new, smooth State Express 3.5s today. be more harmless than a village fate run by the vicar for charity. The little tents and sideshows, the jumble sale, the village ladies all working hard to help the needy. 
what a pity our little fate may turn out to be a fate worse than death. It all looks so jolly this year, Mrs. Matthews. And the weather's been so kind. Vicar, we've been very lucky. Oh, do please have your fortune told before you leave us, won't you? Mrs. Heyman is telling the fortunes this year, and she's working so hard. Well, you know, I've always been rather reserved about having fortunes told at our annual fest. Oh, it's only in fun. Who could be more devout than Mrs. Heyman? Oh, very well. As you say, it's all in a good cause. Come on, ladies, have your fortune told. Cross the old gypsy farm with silver. Oh, afternoon, Vicar. It's going splendidly, isn't it? You're all making it go splendidly, my dear Mrs. Heyman. I've uh, come to have my fortune told, by the way. Come in the tent, Vicar. <laughs> you know, I couldn't get a crystal ball, so I substituted a pack of tarot cards. Oh, oh do sit down. Yes, thank you. Of course, you know the theory behind this kind of divination. <laughs> I don't know anything about it at all. It's so old that the primitive African witch doctor uses the principle when he throws the bones. Yes, it's very ancient and very evil. Oh, well, my dear Vicar, this is one of those occasions on which out of great evil cometh great good, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Charity will benefit after all. Now, one spreads the cards out like this. Oh, there's man's fate, the hanging man, suspended by his feet from a gibbet. The wheel of fortune. It's all symbolic, of course. There is the devil. And there is death. Very interesting to a student of comparative religion, of course. Well, I don't understand anything about it. It's just a game. A to nasty play. game. Unless done in the name of charity, when we all understand the whole thing is merely a joke. The idea was the spirits, the evil spirits, take possession of the diviner. In this case, you, Mrs. Hayden, oh. and spell out the future through the cards. A ridiculous notion, of course. Well, I've got a little book here that tells the combination. Now, in the first place, you're unmarried. Oh, everybody knows that I'm unmarried. Oh, please, Vicar, let's try to preserve something there, but there. There. You're going on a long voyage. But everybody knows I'm visiting the mission stations in Tanzania. You will meet a tall, blonde woman, a widow. Another prospect of romance. Oh, unlikely. <laughs> unlikely for me. Oh, yes. There, you see? You're going to cross water, and there is the prospect of an inheritance. Oh. Fear death by fire. Fear that which flies in the air, but is not a bird. Fear the things of night, the bat, the wolf, the leopard. Speak only truth, or evil will strike you. Oh, please, wake up, Mrs. Haven. Uh, wake up. Uh, oh, mercy me. She seems to fall into some kind of trance. And the shuttle flies back and forth, and the thread is spun into the lives and deaths of men. Fear the flash of fire. Fear the high face of the sun at noon. Fear the agents of the dark. Fear the man with a scowled face. My dear Mrs. Heyman, please. Oh, dear, I, I must get help. Help! Help! Most extraordinary business, Mr. Matthews. Some sort of possession by spirits, eh? Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. No. Oh, probably the spirits came out of a bottle. <laughs> So far as I know, the lady has never let a drop of spirituous liquor pass her lips. Only joking, Vicar. But, but it is most uncanny. Mrs. Heyman went into a trance of some kind. Excuse me, I'd better go to inquire if she's fully recovered. Are you feeling better now, Mrs. Heyman? Oh, it, it was only the heat. I am sorry. It must have been a most unpleasant experience. Uh, tell me, can you remember exactly what occurred? Well, I, I was telling your fortune, and I must... Well, I've simply passed out, that's all. You seem to go into some kind of trance. Uh, do you remember what you said? Oh, it was some nonsense I was making up. You said, fear death by fire. Fear that which flies in the air but is not a bird. No. Uh, fear the things of night. The bat, the wolf, and the leopard. Speak only truth or evil will strike you. Oh, I'm sure I did. Well, I can assure you that you did, Mrs. Heyman. 
I feel that something caused you to give me a warning. Something connected with those evil tarot cards. But what could the warning mean? It all sounds most outlandish to me. Fear death by fire. Well, that's plain enough. Fear that which flies in the air but is not a bird. Oh, why, that would be an aeroplane. Of course. Your trip to Tanzania... You must cancel it at once. Oh, my dear Mrs. Heyman, I can hardly see myself explaining to the bishop that I must take the warning of a pack of cards rather than the evidence of my senses. No, I shall travel as scheduled, and I'd be greatly obliged if you'd refrain from mentioning this matter to anyone, at least until I've arrived safely at my destination. Oh, Dickon, do take care. Uh, of course. And I hope to see you at the mission meeting on Thursday. Then I shall outline the purposes of my visit. But of course I shall be there. The whole village will. Yes, I know. You're all very loyal to me. <laughs> Now, without further ado, I'm going to ask the Reverend John Simmons to tell us about his coming visit to Tanzania. Well, you all know the story. Tom Shelby was born in this village. He was a wayward boy, but did splendidly in the war. Later, he became a prospector in darkest Africa, but he never forgot his home village. Yeah, yeah. After the famous diamond find by Dr. Williamson... Tom Shelby took a quick look at the Ubongi district and discovered the fabulous Shelby diamond pipe. He gave a tithe to the church, one-tenth of the profits of that fabulous mine, and he has named his bequest after this, his native village. It is the wish of the diocese that I go out and tour these mission stations and bring back to you a report of progress. I shall journey to London tomorrow by car and then from London Airport. Oh, where is the man? He really is most exasperating sometimes. Don't worry yourself, he'll show up. But that's the plane for Tanzania standing on the top. Now, he's only got a few minutes. Oh, let's ask him to wait for him. I'm afraid they won't do that, May. He's got scarcely five minutes before she takes off. There's customs and immigration proceedings to go through. Oh, it really is too bad of him. Where can he be? Oh, uh, I say, uh, please, a moment. Where can I hire a car or something? Car? Hire a car? Why, no, sir. Oh, I don't know. My dear man, where is the next village? Uh, behind me, sir. I mean, in front of me. Oh, that I can't say. I be a stranger, you see, from Wemsbury Parver. That's five miles away. Oh, it isn't any use, is it? I'm too late anyway. I, I say, want to live? Oh, yes, indeed. It's frightfully important. You see, I'm catching a plane this morning for... Okay, jump in. In that ridiculous old car. Oh, his own must have broken down. Well, whatever's happened is too late. And the plane's about to take off, I'm afraid. Too cruel, it really is. Oh, the poor vicar. Have I missed my aircraft? Oh, you have. But never mind. There's another leaving tomorrow. Look! Look at the plane! There's something wrong! She's crashing! the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get.
It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3-5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new, smooth, State Express 3-5s today. Is the vicar merely very lucky, or does he have powerful friends? Let's find out, shall we? Personally, I like playing with the tarot cards. But it isn't much fun from the fortune-telling point of view. Because, you see, my future is behind me. <laughs> Vicar, there's a gentleman from Scotland Yard to see you, Inspector Stone. He's with Mr. Matthews now in your study. Uh, yes, I shan't be a moment. Oh, tell me, Mr. Matthews... Did you go to see the vicar off at the airport? Yes, Inspector, I did. I don't mind telling you how envious I was. I know East Africa, and I like it. The great Tom Shelby was my half-brother, you know. Well, that's luck. If the vicar had boarded that play... Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Do you know him well, sir? Uh, who? Uh, the vicar? Yes, fairly well. Why? Can you keep something under your hat? If I have to. Well, that aircraft was sabotaged. Now, don't ask me how or why. There was a Tanzanian cabinet minister aboard... Perhaps they were after him. In any case, the only passenger who didn't quite make it was your vicar. But his baggage got aboard, didn't it? But surely you can't Can't I, sir? Why not? Eh? He must be a suspect, mustn't he? Well, technically, I... But suppose. then there's no motive for him blowing up a plane full of people, is there? Unless he's mad. It's quite unthinkable. I can tell you plenty of stories about him. I've seen the way he cries when he's seen a mouse caught in a trap. He wouldn't as much as shoot a partridge for his dinner. No, you're on the wrong track, I'm afraid, Inspector. May, I'm going to lay out the tarot cards again. Oh, you're mad. Haven't they caused enough trouble already? You aren't thinking very clearly, my dear. The cards warned of the accident. They didn't cause it. Fear the things of night. The wolf, the bat, and the leopard. Isn't that how it went? Then there was a bit about telling the truth or evil coming. Yes, I might get another message. Just let me look out of the window. We can see the vicar's house from here. Yes, the light is still on in the study. Is the police car still outside? Yes. Oh, but they've been with him for hours and hours. That poor man is plagued by the most awful misfortune. Well, I think he was extremely lucky this morning. Don't you? <laughs> with a little less than his luck, he'd be... Well, the other victims are. Lay out the cards. Very well. One touches them. I don't know why, but I've seen gypsies do it. If you want to know, it's a sort of spell, a heathen ritual. They're horrible, aren't they? I find them fascinating. I can see that you're in accord with them somehow. You know, May, I do feel that I am. I felt it from the first time I held them in my hand. Harriet, where did you get them? I bought them from an old gypsy woman. She told me they were true cards. Of course, I didn't believe her. Not then. She showed me how to use them. I wouldn't have had the nerve to go down there alone. Shh. Just a moment. Something's coming through. Read. Read me. Something like... Read me plain. The mud stinks and bubbles blue under the stream-hot sun. He who would win this has already lost. He who has lost has won. Harriet. Now, I want you to go over that bit again, Mr. Simmons. Oh, dear, I, I, I'm dropping off to sleep. You want the swine court who blew up that aircraft, don't you? Yes, yes, you know I do. Then give me your cooperation. You came down the road towards Twelve Trees Junction, and there something went wrong with your car. 
What went wrong, sir? I know nothing about cars, Inspector. There, there was petrol in the tank. The little lights were burning on the dashboard. Oh, that's all I know. It, it just stopped. But I always thought you knew quite a lot about cars. You used to do your own repairs when you was a lad. Unless I'm a lad no longer. You can't compare a car of those days with a modern box of tricks. No, I suppose not, sir. Now, how did this car stop? Did it just cut out? Did it splatter or what? Splatter, I, I think. You think? Don't you know, sir? No, I, I can't remember. I am far too tired. Now, let's come to the Tom Shelby estate. How long has Tom Shelby been dead? Six weeks, that's all. Do you know how much he left? Oh, it must be a colossal amount. And with the mine's earning potential, a thousand million wouldn't cover it. What a lot of good one could do with that money. Can you imagine a man who wanted to do good to the world so much that he'd sacrifice a hundred-odd people for it? The greatest good of the greatest number, as it were? I can't imagine a man so monstrous. But I, I'm perfectly prepared to believe that he could exist. Yeah. Do you know who is the beneficiary under the will? Oh, I've no idea. And I refuse to answer any more of these silly questions. I, I don't care who benefits. Although I'm sure Tom would have left a tithe for the church. So you don't know who's the beneficiary? Why, you are, Mr. Simmons. You are. May, I want... What on earth is going on here? It's Harriet. She was telling fortunes or something, and it happened again, and she screamed, and then she fainted. Oh, that silly fool. Hasn't she caused enough trouble with dabbling in this sort of thing? Oh, help me with her, will you? <laughs> If she'd seen the sort of thing that happened in Africa when you meddled with this divination nonsense, she'd think twice about it. Oh, put her head down. She just said something very strange. How dare you chatter about this kind of evil filth. I'm going down to the village inn for an hour. And when I come back, I want that woman out of my house. Very well, Ralph. Well, Vicar, good night to you. I can let myself out. No, I shall see you to your car. I feel like a breath of fresh air in any case. Oh, as you wish, sir. You'll understand that it's my business to get to the bottom of this matter. What a terrible business it is, too. My sympathies are with you, Inspector. I have no fear. Mm. <sighs> oh, it's a fine night, sir. Yes, yes. On a night like this, I can hardly believe there's such a thing as evil in the world. If only... Get down! Get down, man! Oh. There he goes. He's running off. It's as though a door had opened and released evil upon the world. Oh, there's big money involved. And big money means big risk. And it's the beginning and the end of it. Now, I'll get on to shortwave and have a call put out for that fellow. An armed guard for you, sir. Night and day. Oh, I'm coming... Oh, good morning, Mrs. Heyman. Please come in. I was told your servant hadn't arrived and that you'd no one to look after. Not in the mundane sense, no. It seems there's someone looking after me, though, for I've escaped death twice in 24 hours. I... I read the cards again last night. Oh, I think that was rather foolish of you. However, I must admit they did warn us truly on the first occasion. Yes. That which flies but is not a bird. I rather think that refers to a bullet, not an aircraft... We still had the things of the night and the penalty for telling lies. However, I, I'm not too greatly worried. For the next morning makes no sense to me at all. I, I remember it very clearly, but it still makes no sense. What was the warning? Oh, a sort of garbled verse. The mud sticks and bubbles blue under the steam hot sun. He who would win this has already lost. He who has lost has won. What could that possibly mean? Well, I don't think that's very difficult. Diamondiferous clay is often called blue ground. That must be the blue mud referred to. And the hot sun? That's Africa. One would suppose so. Now, he who would win has already lost. That's clear enough. The person who was trying to obtain possession is fated to disaster, while the man who is most disinterested has already gained possession. But who are these people? I only learned for the first time last night that old Tom Shelby left me his entire gigantic fortune. Oh! Then you're a rich man. No. He who has lost has won. You see, Tom did that because I always befriended him. He did it because he knows I'm unmarried and will remain so. That I'm a man of extremely simple taste. 
that it therefore stands to reason that I shall use this money to advance what we both like to think of as the true and moral aims of life. My dear Mrs. Matthews, whatever is the matter? Ralph is dead. Oh, my dear, oh, I'm very sorry for you. You wouldn't be if you knew he tried to shoot you last night. That he caused the deaths of all those people. I cannot judge him, May. The temptation was very great. He told me the entire thing. He put the bomb in your luggage. Then he tried to shoot you. I don't know what to say. He must have been stark, raving mad. He was Tom Shelby's half-brother. He believed he should have inherited the mine. Oh, of course. Everything would have gone to him if the vicar had died before the will was probated. Yes, I, I suppose it was something like that. But of course he was mad, too. In any case, it's all over for him. He had an accident cleaning his shotgun. Oh, my dear. At least that's better for him and for you. I don't say that, Mrs. Heyman. There's no man so evil that he cannot contain a spark of supreme goodness. Now all is explained. Except for one thing. The cards. How on earth did Harriet get messages from the tarot cards? I have no theories, ladies. I have nothing to say. They won't speak through me again. Before I came here, I threw them in the fire. And my heart was lighter to see them go. That was very wise of you. There is always a price to be paid for magic. And the price is too high to pay. Well, well, well. Poor Ralph Matthews' scheme collapsed like a pack of tarot cards. Would you like a pack? You can get them here, behind the creaking door. the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door? Of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... The Creaking Door. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley. 
a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I say, sir, and what be you doing in the captain's cabin? Do you hear me, sir? What be you doing sitting there writing on the captain's slate? Oh, ignoring me, eh? Now look here, you. This is Captain Strong's own cabin, and no one's got any business of sitting here a right. I, I say, you're not a member of this crew. Put me down. You, why your face? Look at you. Why you're not human, Captain? Captain Strong, Captain. <laughs> Captain Strong! I say, Captain Strong! Captain Strong, sir! Yes, Captain... yes, I think. Well, what is it, man? What, what's all the rumbers? I'm begging your pardon, sir, but there's, well, there's someone in your cabin, sir. Well, who, who is, is it? it? What's that, Isaac? There's someone in the captain's cabin, sir. Who is it? I, I don't rightly know, sir. Well, didn't you see who it was? Yes, Mr. Wilson, that I did, sir. But the captain always locks his cabin, don't you, Captain Strong? I, and I do, but I, I could have forgot. Well, it wasn't locked just now, Captain. You say you got to look at the man? I sir, and full in the face, Captain. If you can rightly call it a face. What's that? What do you mean, Isaac? Yeah, yes, man, speak up. What, what are you trying to tell us? I mean, sir, the man ain't human. He's nothing but a skeleton. What? Nonsense, Isaac. Oh, no, sir, and that is not... I seen him, sir. Look plumb into his face, I did. And there's nothing there but bones. White, bleached bones, sir. Oh, that's ridiculous. With empty eye sockets and a gaping mouth. And he was writing on your slate, sir. Writing on my slate? Aye, Captain. Writing with a piece of white chalk held between his fingers. Fingers with no flesh on them, sir. Well, you, you've been dreaming, Isaac. Come on. Let's get down to my cabin and have a look. Come along, Mr. Wilson. Right, Captain. Isaac, come on. I, I say. Well, it's impossible for anyone to be in my cabin. All hands are either on deck or down in the engine room. That's what I say, Captain Strong. He ain't one of the crew. He ain't rightly nobody, sir. Unless you want to call a spirit somebody. Isaac, stop that sort of talk. Oh, but it ain't no sort of talk, sir. Begging your pardon, Mr. Wilson. I seen him with my own eyes. Sitting there. Dressed in some sort of getup I ain't never laid eyes on before. He had his back to the door. And he was riding on your slate with a chalk, Captain. I spoke to him, but he didn't pay me no mind. Just kept right on with his writing. Then I got closer to him, and he still didn't look up. So I stooped down and peered into his face, I did. And then I... I seen he wasn't nothing but a skeleton, sir. Well, if you were a drinking man, Isaac, I'd have you flogged and put in irons. I'm not so sure he hasn't been at the keg, Captain. Begging your pardon, sir. You'll see for yourself soon enough. Here's the hatch. You first, Captain. Just as I thought. Nobody here. Oh, cabin's empty. But I locked this door, Captain. So whoever it was couldn't get out. Well, you must have done that all right. I certainly unlocked it just now. 
You can see for yourself, Isaac, there's, there's no one in here. No, nobody. And no way out except through that door. I say, Captain, have a look. Yes, Mr. Wilson, one is your slate. There is writing on it. Eh? What's that? Well, here, here, let me, let me see. Here. There, Captain Strong. You see, sir? That's not your writing, is it? No. No, it isn't my writing. Then one of the men must have been in here and wrote that. No, I don't think so. Because this writing is a style and a type that was used more than 200 years ago. What? Well, let's see. Hmm. I say, that is strange writing. It's English, all right. Such a peculiar spelling and phrasing. Blimey, I can't read it at all. Isaac. Aye, aye, Captain. I'm seeing this. I can't help but believe that you saw somebody sitting here in my cabin writing on my slate. But I won't be convinced that it was a, a skeleton. But I tell you, sir, I... It was your imagination, Isaac. Oh, no, sir, it wasn't no imagination. I said it was your imagination. You understand? Aye, sir. Now, I don't want you to open your mouth about this to the crew. You hear me? There's, well, there's, there's some explanation. I'm not going to have you stirring up the crew with this. They're all superstitious enough without that. I said. Those are orders, Isaac. I'll have you in irons if you breathe a word of this to the man. I, I, sir. That's all, Isaac. I, sir. Well, Captain Strong? What do you make of it, Wilson? Most extraordinary. I'm positive Isaac did see someone in this cabin. But surely not a... Not a... Fleshless creature? I don't know. Isaac is a sober, steady sort of person. But confounded man. He hasn't much imagination. Well, who ever heard of a skeleton aboard a ship, much less one that could write on a slate? Stranger things than that have happened at sea. You know that. Yeah. Yeah, that I do. But I can't convince myself that what Isaac saw was really some... A fleshless creature without a brain or heart or eyes. Can you make out the writing on the slate? Yeah, I think so. It says, It is not correct the information you have about the sea phantom. Change your course six degrees north, northeast, to location 26 degrees, seven minutes longitude... 18 degrees, 9 minutes latitude. Jonathan Strange. Jonathan Strange? No. No, it can't be. He was the famous captain of the Spanish galleon, the Sea Phantom. The one we're hoping to locate. Yeah, and he was. Jonathan Strange. Dead for 224 years. Lost in a gale in 1718. Yes, but not in the position this message on the slate directs us to. No. No, indeed. The sea phantom was supposed to have foundered at 20 degrees longitude. The message says 26 degrees and 7 minutes. Yes. Could this be a trick? A trick, Captain? Someone else who's heard of the immense treasure that went down with the sea phantom. Someone who's trying to steer us off our course. Get to the treasure themselves. I doubt that. What do you say you doubt it, Mr. Wilson? Well, sir, we've kept the entire expedition completely secret. Not even the crew know what we're up to. We've tried to keep the entire expedition a secret. I'm positive I haven't mentioned to anyone. Nor have I, Captain Strong. When I stumbled upon the information about the Sea Phantom, I knew there was an excellent opportunity to recover almost a million dollars worth of gold. But naturally, I needed a boat. You were the first one I thought of. Neither of us would have had a reason for disclosing our knowledge about the treasure. That's just it. That's why I'm so inclined to believe Isaac was telling us the truth. About the thing without flesh, right in this message? Precisely. Ah, oh, that's, that's unbelievable. Even so, Captain. You must admit that a man who's been dead more than 200 years certainly wouldn't be much... More than a skeleton. Isn't uh, that right? You mean... Uh, good heavens. You mean this message was actually written 
By Jonathan Strange himself. I mean exactly that. Hmm. I wonder. What about it, Captain? Do we change the course? I don't know. What's your advice? Normally, I'm not superstitious. But, well, what can we do? I've never believed in ghosts or spirits up to now. But that message on that slate certainly is convincing. Then you're in favor of following the instructions. Well, Mr. Wilson? Yes. Let's change the course and go to the spot the message mentions. If you're willing to take a chance, I certainly am. Yes, who's there? Me, sir, Isaac Newton, sir. Well, come in and stop that noise. Now, oh, what in thunder's gotten into you, waking me up in the middle of the night? What time is it, anyway? Eight bells, sir. Midnight. Midnight? A big day ahead tomorrow. Oh, confounded man, what do you want? Well, I'm... I'm standing watch alone tonight, sir. I... I maybe I should have told this to the captain, but I... I come to you first. Well? Uh, I just sighted a boat to the port side, sir. Well, have you identified her? Oh, no, sir. You see, well, she ain't carrying no lights, sir. No lights? Oh, no, sir. And she's not like any ship I've ever seen, sir. Hmm. Uh, to the port side, you say? Aye, sir. She's riding with full sail. What? Aye, sir. She looks to me like one of those old-time boats you see in pictures. Hand me my boots there, Isaac. I'll come up on deck and have a look. She blows, sir. You see? Not a sign of life aboard her, sir. And the moon's full tonight. Look, man. Look. Uh, what, Mr. Wilson? That name on the bow. I can't see that far, sir. My eyes are... That aren't name. Seen. The Sea Phantom. Sea Phantom, sir? Yes. No wonder she's carrying no lights. No wonder there's no one aboard. What do you mean, sir? Isaac, if you've never seen a ghost ship, take a look at that boat out there. Ghost ship? Yes. The Sea Phantom went down in these waters more than 200 years ago. Blow me down, sir. Are you having a joke with me, Mr. Wilson? No. No, this is no joke. That's a ghost ship, right enough. You watch. She'll be gone in a minute or two. I'm begging your pardon, sir. But that boat's real. Ghost ships always look real, Isaac. But look you, sir. She's close enough to see. She's within throwing distance, I do believe. Here. This belaying pin here, Mr. Wilson. I, I'll i try to throw it aboard the sea phantom. Good. You watch. <laughs> that pin will just go through thin air. We'll see, sir. Well, here it goes. Ah. There, sir. You hear that? She is real. But that boat's so old, she should have fallen apart years ago. And besides that, she's supposed to be at the bottom of the Atlantic. She looks old enough, all right, sir. But I don't understand what you mean about her supposed to be... Isaac. Aye, sir. Lower a boat. A boat, sir? Yes, confounded a boat. Lower one at once. Are we going aboard the sea phantom, Mr. Wilson? I am, yes. Now lower a boat to the port side and double quick about it. Stop blowing now, Isaac. He's up alongside. Aye, sir. Yeah. Tie up to that rope hanging there. Right, sir. There. All set, sir. Right. Well, you stay here and watch, Isaac, while I go aboard. If I'm not back in a half hour, come aboard looking for me. Aye, aye, sir. Half an hour, sir. If you're not back by then, sir, I'll come aboard after you. Keep a sharp lookout, Isaac. Let me know if you see anybody aboard. Aye, aye, sir. Thank you. 
So quiet aboard. Can't even hear the wind. No sign of life. No sign of life having been here for score upon score of years. Rotting timbers. Sea-soaked deck. Twisted, tangled ropes. Empty kegs with rusted hoops and warped staves. Strips of time-worn sails. And canvas swaying on the masts. Everything so, so quiet. Quiet as though in reverence for the dead. Uh, here, the hatch. Captain's quarters must be down here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This must have been his hangout. Let's have a look. Hmm. A light burning in here. Hey, say, what's that? Oh. Bones. An entire human skeleton slumped here in the corner of the cabin. As though a man had propped himself up there and died. Exactly, my friend. Who's that? Did someone speak? Certainly me. But where are you? Over here. But I don't see you. There's no one in this room but myself. Yourself and that gentleman slumped there in the corner. Who are you? My name is Jonathan Strange. Jonathan Strange? Why, well, you're the skipper of the Sea Phantom. That I am. Jonathan Strange, captain of the Sea Phantom, sailing with a cargo of gold for the Spanish rulers. But why, your boat went down in a gale 200 years ago. So history says, yes. But men do not know everything. I don't understand. The Sea Phantom was no victim of a storm at sea. Oh, no, my friend. She was the victim of a cruel and vicious man. I still don't understand. Look here. You see the rusted iron ring there on the floor by your feet? Uh, yes. Take hold of it and pull. The trap door to in my cabin. That's it. it Maybe difficult. Use your strength on it. A little more force now. Now, that's it. There. You see? Gold. Bar upon bar of solid gold. Yes, gold for the king of Spain. And chests of coins and jewels. One day for the queen. But Jose would have them for his own. He intends to mutiny the crew and steal the treasures that have been entrusted to us. Who's this Jose? Jose Menel, a wicked and cold-hearted fiend. Even now the crew is waiting for me to leave this cabin. They know they'll never enter here while life is in my body. But Surely there's some escape. No, none. They think I will remain here to starve to death. <laughs> They're fools. They do not know that they're about to perish. Like the rats they are. What do you mean? Don't you smell the smoke? Listen. You can hear the flames. Yes. Yes, I do. And they cannot escape in the boats. Because I foresaw this mutiny. And put the lifeboats... Out of commission. But can't you escape? No, of course not. For you to escape, you must make haste, my friend. How? Oh. The same way you went of here, of course. Hurry now, my friend, and take this with you. What is it? What, what are you giving me? You'll see. Hurry now. There's no time to waste. Soon the ship will be one mass of roaring flames, and none of us will be left alive. Can't I take you with me? Can't you make yourself a parent so I can see you and take you along? No, it doesn't matter. But let me warn you. With my life, I've protected the treasures of the king and queen. Throughout all eternity, I'll guard those treasures. It will not be wise for any man to attempt to obtain them for his own. Yes, Jonathan Strange. I believe I understand exactly what you mean. That's why you brought me here. To show me. Exactly. I must hurry. Mr. Wilson, sir. Are you in there, Mr. Wilson? Isaac, is that you? I sir. Blow me down, Mr. Wilson. This beastly bolt's of fire. If we don't get off of here in a jiffy, we'll be paying a visit to Davy Stone's locker before we do it, sir. Then... 
So, Captain Strong, that's exactly what happened. And I repeat, it was no nightmare. Isaac here can vouch for that. It's the very truth, Captain Strong. Word for word. So help me heaven. Hmm. And that was fair warning. And whoever attempts to get the treasures of the sea phantom is doomed. Why, sir. Just as those mutineers were doomed 200 years ago, sir. It's odd. Very odd. I'm amazed you or the others of the crew weren't awakened by the sound of the fire. No. None of us heard a sound. The men don't even know about it now. I wouldn't have known it about it myself if you two hadn't told me your story. If I hadn't seen those bits of charred wood floating on the surface this morning. It was a huge treasure, Captain. I saw it in its hiding place, beneath the skipper's cabin. And you got none of it? Not a single bit. Oh, wait. I almost forgot. Just before I left the boat, this thing was handed to me. Handed to you? But I thought you said there was nothing in that cabin but a pile of bones. Yes. Yes, that is right. But but this seemed to come, well, almost out of nowhere. And it was placed very firmly in my hands. He sure enough had it in his hands when I broke into the cabin, sir. Uh, let's have a look. Hmm. Why, this was the ship's log. The log? Yes. The complete log of the Sea Phantom's voyage. From the date of sailing, right on up through the mutiny. Look. This writing. It's the same hand. The writing on my slate and the writing on this paper are the very same. Curve for curve, angle for angle. Here, let me see. Oh, I say, Captain. Yes, Mr. Wilson. Look here. On this last page. It reads... Now that it has become my solemn duty to protect the treasures which have been entrusted to me, I will send the sea phantom to her ocean grave together with the treasure. This is my course as I see it. God assist me. Jonathan Strange, May 29th, 1718. You have heard The Sea Phantom. Tonight's tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Ben Morris was heard tonight as Mr. Wilson. Fred Wayne played Captain Strong. Muir Height was Isaac and Garland Moss was Captain Jonathan Strange, skipper of The Sea Phantom. Next Friday at this time, we'll bring you another dark fantasy drama. Being the 13th story in this series... And next Friday, being Friday the 13th, Scott Bishop defies superstition utterly and completely to bring you one of his most exciting and unusual tales. Listen for... W is for werewolf. A weird adventure laid upon a sunny tropical island where all seems peaceful and serene, but where a grim and vicious destiny festers slowly into breathtaking, unbelievable reality. Dark Fantasy originates each Friday night in the WKY Studios, Oklahoma City. Tom Paxton speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Lights out for the devil and Mr. O. It is later than you think. your lights now. We bring you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. Arch Obler. Have you ever felt the inner fury of revenge, the need to get back at someone? Listen then to my story titled No Escape after this short message. In a sanctum mystery. This is your host, welcoming you through the squeaking door. Not for a half hour of terror, but to tell you about Radio Nostalgia Magazine. Radio Nostalgia Magazine is a must for old-time radio fans. It's the magazine with many photos and stories of old-time radio and its stars. Our current issue features a 16-page article on The Shadow. All subscribers will get a free Captain Midnight decoder badge, a Captain Midnight Flight Patrol membership, and a flight commander certificate from the Secret Squadron. To get your copy, send $1.50 in check or money order to Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, 07087. That's Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, Zip 07087. Send now and get a free 8x10 photo of the Lone Ranger in Tonto, boys and girls. This is Mr. O again. Courtroom scenes have always intrigued me. The judge on his dais, a very human being asked to play the part of God with happiness and joy, bitterness and tears, yes, even life and death, determined by the state of his very human mind, his very human nerves, yes, even the state of his very human digestive processes. Now, there's a jury in this courtroom you're about to enter. Uh, by the way... If you haven't turned out your lights yet, please turn them out now and listen to No Escape. You've got ten minutes with him, Counselor. I know, I know. Well, Rogan, I understand you wanted to see me. Sit down, Counselor. I'm very busy. You understand? Sit down. I... Yes. What's on your mind? There's always a chance, you know. The jury's been out three hours. The devil with the jury. Get me a knife. Huh? Get me a knife. A knife? Are you insane? A knife. Get me one. But but why? You've got a chance. My my final summation, the jury might my deadlock. Yes, deadlock. Shut and up I... and listen to me. Well? When the jury comes in, he'll be there sure. He? Mark Street. Oh. Oh, him. You still don't believe. Oh, but I, I do, I do. I 
definitely believe that an individual by that name does exist. Exist? He killed my wife. But, but the evidence... He killed my wife, you hear me? He killed my wife. Yes, yes, I know. Now you listen to me. You listen or I'll make you listen. For days you've been out there in that courtroom talking words. Words, high-sounding legal words. All the time you wouldn't believe the word I told you. All the time back at that mug of yours you've been thinking, yeah, he killed her, he killed her. I killed her. The swellest thing that ever came into a man's life. Now, Mac, I want you to Let know... Let me get that... it out of me. Marie was my wife. She, she was helping me and loving me. Guy come along who couldn't stand her being happy. He took a look at Marie and in that rat mind he must have said to himself, okay, beautiful, I'm going to get you. How and when, I don't know, but someday, beautiful, someday. That's what he said. And that's what he did. What? One night he came over. Sure, he got to be my friend. He came over and when Marie told him I was working late down at the plant, he said he'd wait for me. Business. Business of hell. What? Oh, how can I tell you? I, I can only think it in my head and remember it in my head. I hear her. I hear her back you. Fighting again. Fighting. I don't hear anything. Fighting. Fighting. She must have clawed at his eyes. And that knife in his hand. He stabbed her once. And again, in the third time. When I got home, she had strength to whisper just two words to his name. And then she was dead. And he killed her. He'd frame me so I'd take the rat me that loved her. Mark Street, he did it. You hear me, Mark Street? But, but no trace of the man. He'll come back, I tell you. He'll come back now to hear that jury speak its peace. He'll come back. I know he will. That'll be my chance to get him. Get me that knife. But, Mac, please. My knife, I got to have it. He'll be there. I can give it to him once, twice, three times the way he did to her and his face and his neck and his dirty heart dead the way she's dead, his blood wiping out what he did to her. A knife. Get me a knife. You got it, Mac. Everything's going to be all right. The knife. Where is it? You certainly didn't think I'd really. Well, I, I mean, a man in my position. You didn't bring it. Be sensible, Mac. How could I? Your wild story about revenge against a man nobody you knows. Devil is... cross, Mac. The jury's coming in. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached the verdict? We have, Your Honor. You will read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant is charged in the indictment guilty of murder in the first degree. Yeah, all right, all right. There's no one rise and face the court. He's talking to you, Mac. What? The prisoner will rise. The judge, get up, Rogan. Mark Street. You're here, I know it. Mac, Rogan, have you anything to say before sentence is passed upon you? I see him. Rogan, what's the matter? Mark Street, he's here, here. Mark Street, you're here, I see you. I'll get you now. Get him, somebody. Oh, he's here. Mark Street, I've got to get him and kill him. He framed me. He killed him. Let me go home. No, no, let go of me. You can't let him get away. You can I saw him. Mark Street, listen to me. I'll get you. I tell you, I'll get you like you got her. Three times. What's across your face and what's through the neck? What's through your heart? I'll get you, Mark Street. I swear, I'll get you. <laughs> I'm asking you as a particular favor to me, Rogan, to behave yourself. Yeah. Now, every man in this cell block is a condemned man. Disturbances just make it harder for everyone concerned. I ain't going to be with you long, Warden. There's two weeks yet, my boy. I'm not going out that way. Oh. Escape, eh? I'm just telling you not to count too much on springing that trap. Don't try it, Rogan. No man's ever escaped from the death house in this penitentiary. And no man ever will. Yeah. Well, this is it, Rogan. Yeah, I would. Oh, hello, Rico. Oh, guard. Open the cell door. In, Warden. In here, Rogan. Uh, what's the matter, Warden? Is your hotel getting crowded, so you got to give me a roommate? Now behave yourselves, men. 
I don't want any trouble. Well, I sure wouldn't. We don't make any trouble. I hope not. See you later. <laughs> the warden's like a school teacher. Huh, Rogan? How do you know my name? Yeah, there ain't much going on around here Rico Bartelli don't know. Yeah? Yeah. What do you want to know? How do you get out of here? Well, um, uh, there's two ways. Um, one through that door where you just came in with the warden. And the other through that green door down there at the other end. That's a funny door. It only opens up one way. They're not going to hang me. Yeah, a lot of guys say that, but they feed the worms just the same. I'm getting out of here. Well, it's easy just to talk. I got to get out. Why? To kill you crazy? Well, never mind. To me, it don't make no difference just so long as you help me. I told you Rico about telling those lots of things. Well, listen to this. I know where to crack this place. You're just talking. A guy in my spot don't just talk, my friend. Me, I ain't got time for talk. Yeah? They think they're going to hang me three days from now. Oh. Yeah, that's why when I say something, I mean it. For you, too. You got the guts. I'm listening. Look, every day, four o'clock, they'll let me and you out in the room down there that they call an exercise room. We're supposed to walk up and down and get exercise so we'll feel good when they stretch our neck. Only you and me in the exercise room for ten minutes. No guards. They figure it's all right. Because the room ain't got nothing in there, no window. And the guard locks it up from the outside. Then how do you expect... I'm trying to tell you. In the room, there's nothing. Bare walls. Bare floor. And in the floor, there's one iron saw that leading down to the saw that runs under this place to the river. Marie? Sure, sure. You do like I say, and Marie will see you pretty quick. This water, how deep is well, it? Well, No, no. It doesn't make any difference. I can swim in it. Yeah, not in this water, my friend. Why not? How far is it from where we can get in the sewer to the river? A mile. I can swim a dozen yeah, miles. Not in this water. Why not? Tell me, why not? Hey, you guys, pipe down. Okay, screw. We're going to sleep. Tell me. Why not? Because, my friend, after the pipe that's under the exercise room goes a little way, it joins the main pipe. Well? And on the main so there's no room to swim. The pipe's filled to the top with water. I'll swim it anyway. And breathe what? The water? I've got to get out. Sure, you've said that before. But you ain't going to get out if you don't listen to Rico. I tell you, the water in the sewer is up to the top. Maybe half or one inch clear air up on top. Not enough to swim, my friend. But just enough to get air. If you got the right thing. What? A diving rig? No. A little piece of rubber pipe that you keep in your mouth. And you stick it up out of the water so you suck in the air while you walk through the water. That's over your head. Where do you get the rubber hose? Here. Yeah. See? I got one right here. And I got another one for you. This end stuck in my mouth. This end I raise it high like this. So it sticks up out of the water and I suck up that little inch of air that's waiting up there on top. Mark Street, I'll be coming for you soon. Mark Street, what's that? All I want to know is you're going to break with me down the saw tomorrow. Man, you don't know what you're doing for me. Uh, shut your mouth. I do it because I can't lift a heavy saw lid by myself. But with you, we'll lift it. We'll lift it. Okay. Tomorrow, four o'clock, we try, huh? Four o'clock. <laughs> Now a word from your station before we turn to No Escape. You'll probably hear a lot of charity commercials this year asking you for money. They'll all be for worthy causes. But unless a disease touches you personally, or unless you realize how serious it is, you tend to think of it as just another charity. Now there's one disease that everyone's heard of, but very few people realize how serious it is. The fact is, this disease afflicts 8 million Americans. The fact is, it kills more people each year than automobile accidents. The fact is, it's the fourth major health problem in the United States. So that's not just another charity. The sad thing is, we have some of the answers for this disease. We just don't have the money to use them. Do we have to wait until someone close to you gets kidney disease before you begin to take it seriously? Kidney disease is not just another charity. It's the fourth major cause of death in this country. This is Charlton Heston asking you to support the National Kidney Foundation, Box 353, New York, New York. This is Mr. O again. Let's go back to our story of no escape. This is the day and the time for the two condemned men to make their try for freedom and revenge. Get 
plenty of exercise, boys. Won't be long now. Sure, that's well exercise. Rico, the floor, there's no sewer lid in it. Do you think they got a label on it or something? Quit talking. We've got to move fast. Show me for the leather. Okay, okay. Keep your pants on. Yeah. You see the circle on the floor? Yeah. That's a lid. It's covered with cement just like the floor. Mark, I'm in heaven, all that weight, how we lift it out. Keep quiet. Yeah. I got something that'll do the work. A cold chisel. I told you, Rico Bartelli, he's a smart guy. This little piece of steel cost me plenty. But I got her and she's gonna get me right out of here. Now listen. Yeah. Look. I stick the chisel on the crack. I push up. The cover, it comes up a little bit. Then you stick your fingers underneath. Okay. I got it. There. Now get your fingers under. Yeah. Okay. Now lift. <laughs> lift. Fingers. Let's go. Okay. You drop down there first. I don't know how deep the water is. Here it goes. Roger. Is it all right down there? Yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Water's not so deep. It's only up to my waist. Which way now? This way. Come on. It's so blasted dark. I know the way. Ah. Yeah. The pigs. Faster. Lead the way fast. I can't go too fast. Main sore someplace along here. I might fall in. Okay. Whoa. Yes. Thanks. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, it's black, I can't see nothing. I'll make a run. Shut up. What? Shut up. The water, don't you feel? It's moving faster. Yeah, you're right. That means the main saw's up ahead. Come on. Don't get so excited. Why shouldn't I? The main pipe's ahead. Yeah, the main pipe's ahead. That means we're going right. Oh, I'm not afraid of drowning as I can't drown. I've got to kill him first. I can't drown. Oh. No. That doesn't matter to you. Come on. Wait a minute. Give me my piece of rubber hose first. Rubber hose? Yeah, sure. Like you told me to breathe through in the main sewer. Give it to me now and get the water separates us. Give you what? What's the matter with you? Me? Tell me what's up. Sure. Sure, why not? I only got one piece of rubber hose. But Rico, you said... What I say and what is that's two different things. I got one. For me. And me? You. You help me lift up the solid. Okay, that's swell. Now, if you want to go out and knock off that guy you always talk about, okay, I ain't stopping you. Take a swim for yourself. Give me that piece of hose. You better take that swim while you're still healthy, my friend. Give me that hose. Stay back from me. Give it to me. Okay, I'll give you a... Oh, my arm. Mm. Yeah. That old chisel tried to knife me. Hey, get out. You. Oh, I definitely hurt you now. Oh, oh I am. Oh. Yes, your arm, Rico. Bending it to make you bend over. Bend over, Rico, over. Get that head of yours under the water. No. No. Drink it, Rico. Fill your double crossing lungs with it. Drink. <laughs> All right, Rico. Now I got the chisel and the hose. Now you take that swim that you were gonna give me. Now, 
Mark Street. I'm coming after you. Hey, now, but shut the door. We're closed, see? Might as well scram. One o'clock's closing hours in this town. Help me. Hey, what's the matter with you? Mark Street. Huh? What's that you said? Mark Street. Where is he? Mark Street? Oh, you mean that lanky chiseler that... I, uh... I, uh... I didn't know exactly. I, I mean, I... Well, I... I ain't seen the guy recent. Where? Where is Hennessy Street? Yeah, that's it. I remember hearing a couple of the boys saying he moved in up there. Say, say, wait a minute, fella. Don't you want a drink? Don't you want me to get... Well, is that a note? Walks right out on me. I wonder what in the... Gee, ain't that a funny thing? It ain't rained around here for a week. And the guy's clothes were soaking wet. To disturbing the peace. Well, what's the matter? Tell me. Tell you what? What's the matter? You drunk? What do you want? Mark Street. Mark Street? Is that what you said? They told me. He's staying here. He was staying here, you mean? He's gone? That's all right. He's gone. Tell me. Where? Where is he now? He's down six feet in the Rosamont Cemetery. Mark Street. He's died last week. Good night. Mark Street. Died last week. <laughs> no, Mark Street, you can't cheat me that way. Rosamont Cemetery said. All right, Mark Street. I'm coming out to you. Why is John Burton? Hello. It's so dark. So dark if only the moon would... Ah, now I can see. Here lies my... beloved wife. No, 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 not you. Mark Street, where are you? Where? So many graves, white stones, moonlight, so many dead. If you are here, I'll find you. Here lie the mortal remains of Henry O. Oh, no. I've got to find you, Mark Street. I've got to. Maybe this one. Here lies Mark Street. I found you, Mark Street. I found you. All these dead, I found you. But are you dead? I must know. I will 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 know. I will. I will. I will know. I will know. I will know. The coffin. The coffin. Oh, I'm down to you at last, Mark Street. Now I'll know. Oh, they covered you well. If it is you. Yes. It is you, Mark Street. Cheated me. Oh, no. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe that a... Maybe in another world beyond this one. A world of dead. Where you are now. I'll go there. I'll go there. I'll get you there. Rico's cold chisel in my hand. I'll shove it in my heart, and then I'll be just like you. You hear me, Mark Street? It's Mac. Mac Rogan talking to you wherever you are. I'm coming to you. Uh-huh. 
Mac, Mac Rogan. Mac, 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 I don't know. I, I heard you calling me. Mac Rogan. It is you, Marie. I heard you. I can hardly see. I don't know where I am, but I heard you. You got your wish, my darling. What? Look. There in front of you. Mark Street. Mark Street at last? No! No, let me go! The dead can't kill the dead! Let me go! And the knife! The knife you killed her with is in my hand! The knife! At last, Mark Street, I'll give you what you gave her! No, no! Once in the face! No. Twice! A third time! No. Go back to your grave, Mark Street. And I'll go to mine. This is Mr. O. Arch Obler. Again, someone has written me asking me that question. Mr. Obler, do you believe in life after death? I'll answer that listener's question with a question. A friend, supposing we could turn time backwards and have Honest Abe Lincoln with us now, and supposing, just supposing, we were to ask Mr. Lincoln a very ordinary question for our time. Uh, President, do you think it's possible to have pictures and sound in full living color passing through our body right now? Well, just as, as it would be very difficult for President Lincoln to even conceive of the electromagnetic waves passing through us at this very moment. So, perhaps, it's difficult for any of us to admit of the possibility of life existing on wavelengths beyond our own concept. So, to the question, would it be possible for the dead to live on for revenge, I can only answer, I hope sincerely that if they do, they exist for love. Which brings me to next week's play, after a message from your station. Hi, Joey. What you doing? Huh? Nah, me either. Nothing. Huh? Yeah, well, we could go over to the school and see what's happening there. How much will you pay for this boy? Nah, that's too far. Where do we get a car? Maybe he'll never cost you a yeah, dime. That, that's, yeah. But suppose he ends up in the well, welfare on, line man. or even jail. So what do you want to do? Then he's going to cost about $10,000. Uh, I guess anything's better than hanging around here. It costs a local scout council just a few dollars a year to keep a boy active in scouting. We tell you this because we need your help. Scouting gets part of its support from campaigns like the United Way. All the rest of scouting support must come from people like you. Okay, listen, I'll meet you. I'll meet you there then. Please, support scouting any way you can. This is Mr. O again. Before I tell you of next week's play, let me answer another listener by telling her that, yes, I've written a book. Its title is House on Fire, and it's full of chills and thrills and many other things, and it's published by Bartholomew House. Next week here, well, it's a story about a vacation, a very peculiar vacation where a man and a woman and a child find themselves in a... But uh, that's next week. It is later than you think.
Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Plays no favorite. It could happen to you. Book 84. Page 327. In the Diary of Fate. Yes, here it is. The name Peter Drake. Occupation, treasurer of Lewis Swerdling and Company. A comfortable life for a man of your temperament, wasn't it, Peter? A life that required few important decisions. An occupation that dealt primarily with numbers. You would have gone on in your work secure and contented. Had it not been for your wife, Marcia... She was blindly proud and avaricious. But you loved her, didn't you, Peter? Because of that love, you stand now in the bedroom of your home, the muzzle of a pistol pressed against your temple. And in less than a minute, you will be dead. Soon I will write the final entry under the name Peter Drake. When I have written... I shall read from his record in The Diary of Fate. I hope you'll understand. Yes, Peter Drake. It was your unreasoning love for your wife that forced you from the security of your world of numbers. And it was the impelling power of her greedy ambition that drove you to a grim decision. The most important decision of your life. But the ultimate outcome was determined by a little thing. So commonplace and innocent that you failed to notice it that night when you stealthily stepped into your cousin's room. Hello, Arthur. Peter, what are you doing sneaking in here at this hour? Why, are you drunk? You're working late, Arthur. Are you worried? Uh, yes, I am. I, I don't know what to do. I do. I know the answer, Arthur. And this is your last chance. I'll tell you if you're making a partner. So that's why you came here. No. Get out of here. Go on. Get out. Oh, no. Not yet, I. What are you doing? Drop that gun. Since when do you keep your gun on your desk? Afraid of burglars, Arthur? No, Peter, please. Give me back my gun. Sit down, Arthur. There, desk. What are you going to do, Peter? No! No! <laughs> As you fired that shot, Peter Drake, a plan was put in motion, and the end for you was certain. At that moment, I, fate, moved unnoticed into your life. Little things, a moment's hesitation, a sudden rainstorm, a lost wallet. These are the tools with which I work. 
Let us turn back to the point where it all began. The country club dance. Marcia had planned on the occasion for weeks. Regarded it as an important social opportunity. And yet, it was only half over and you were on your way home. I can't understand you, Marcia. You talk about nothing but that dance for a month, and then for no apparent reason, you want to leave in the middle of it. No apparent reason? Are you blind? What was the matter? I'll tell you. Very simple life. I've never been so completely humiliated in my life. Thurman and Arthur Swordman and their fat wives at a table with the governor. And we seated at the other end of the hall with that, with that obnoxious Mr. Ross. So Ross isn't a bad sort, Marcia? A fool. And a nobody. And so are the rest of the people at our table. Complete nobody. Well, Cousin Sherman's wife made certain of that. Harriet, don't be absurd. She's jealous of me. She made sure I wasn't on the awards committee, nor the receiving line, nor anything else that might have put me in the public eye. Marcia, darling, we've been over the same thing a thousand times. And I'm fed up with it. Sick and tired of being pushed around by the mighty squirtling. We've got to be patient. Uncle Lewis left the business to Thurman and Arthur, not to me. And the poor nephew became treasure. The main treasure for six years. You're brilliant, Peter. You're too smart to say treasure. You have more brains than the two of them. You should be a partner. Please, Marsha. Then let them try to snub and slight and look down their noses. Do something about it. Demand it. You've got You've got to become a partner. Yes, Peter. You felt the security of your sheltered world crumble before the insistent nagging of your wife, whom you love deeply. You would do as Marcia asked. You had even begun to believe she was right when an hour after you arrived at your office, the next morning, you boldly entered the office occupied by your cousin, Thurman, and Arthur. You uh, left the party early last night, Peter. Anything wrong? No, I had a headache, that's all. Well, too bad. Nice party. Well, Peter, uh, what do you want to see me about? That's her account? No, Thurman, that's been taken care of. I want to talk about my position here. I'm not satisfied, Thurman. What do you mean, Peter? Just this. I want to be taken in on equal footing. I want to be up there with you and Arthur. What are you talking about? I'll handle this now, Arthur. Now, look, Peter. As a treasurer, you're tops. Keeping books, watching expenses, that sort of thing. That's what you're best suited for. As far as making the big deals, handling our delicate foreign commitments, well, I think it. You're still a good treasurer. Look here, Thurman. I've made big money for this company for years. I handled our war contracts. I established our overseas trade. Yes, you've always done your job well, Peter. No question about that. But no one man is indispensable. Now, don't forget that. And don't force my hand, Peter. You mean... You mean you'd fire me? Now, now let's be sensible about this. Right now, there's nothing open. Arthur and I can handle the whole show. We need to. We want you. Exactly where you are. I think we understand each other. Now, is there anything else? No, Simon. Nothing else. Very well. Then let's forget it. Yes, Marcia, I talked to Thurman and Arthur. Things look much better. I'm confident that soon... How soon, Peter? Oh, I don't know. It all depends. They both agree my work has done the firm a lot of good. Did they say anything specific? Well, they said they're not quite ready yet, but when things pick up... Oh, Peter, they're stalling you. And they'll keep on stalling you forever. Well, I'm tired of waiting. I'm not going to wait. What do you mean? I mean I'm through. Six years I've been insulted and looked down on by this word. Can't take any more. I'm through, I tell you. Through. Marsha, Marsha, you don't mean that. You can't leave me. Peter, you're hurting my arm. You can't leave me, do you hear? I won't let you. 
I love you more, sir. I love you so much that I do want anything. My arms. Please, Marcia, you've got to give me more time. You'd need a whole lifetime. Harriet and Bertha are afraid of me. They'll see that you never get in. I will. I swear I will. But I need time. I love you so, darling. Please, please give me time. All right, Peter. I'll give you six months. Frankly, I think it's a waste of time. You'll get into the firm only when the Swirdling brothers are dead and buried. By that time, I'll be too old to care. Yes, Peter. Your wife had issued an ultimatum. You were forced to a decision. All that night, her words raced through your tortured mind. And by morning, you had reached your decision and established your plan. At the office, you said no more about a partnership. You did your work patiently and quietly. Several weeks went by, and when your chance came, you seized it. You had taken the monthly report into Thurman's office. What's this? Oh, monthly report, eh? Well, thank you, Peter. Congratulations, my boy. That Bertha thing was a nice piece of work. Thanks, Thurman. did work out well, didn't it? Uh, would you like to go over the report? No, no. I'm sure it's in fine shape. You just leave it on the desk. By the way, uh, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. I've been getting a little outdoor exercise lately, and... Oh, uh, incidentally, Thurman, perhaps you would like to come with me tomorrow. Well, duck hunting. Uh, you used to be a pretty good shot, and uh, I have an excellent place up on the lake. Well, <laughs> sounds great, Peter. I like nothing better. But uh, <laughs> I've got a golf date with Larry Cole back tomorrow. Maybe some other time. Okay, but uh, if you have any questions on the report, I'll, I'll be in the office all afternoon. Uh, just a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, about this duck shoot. Could we be back by noon? Yes, if we leave early, say about 4.30. Fine. George, I'll do it. You, uh, pick me up at 4.30. Fine. I'll pick you up at your house. Good, good. Uh, better sharpen your sight, boy. You're gonna have to go to some to beat me. I'll be gunning with a vengeance. Don't worry, Sam. So will I. What's the matter, Peter? You're, you're shivering. I'm freezing. Aren't you cold? Oh, I like it. Ah, it's invigorating. How'd you ever find this place? Not another soul in sight. Uh oh. Here they come. It's your shot, Peter. Oh, you missed again. It's this gun. There's something wrong. I, I can't seem to get the right trigger for you. Uh, maybe it's these gloves. <laughs> Blame the gun, the cold, even the ducks. But never the hunter, huh? <laughs> Uh, you can't get away with that. I've got four already. Oh, uh, take your gloves off like I did. Don't have to. I, I still think it's the gun. Uh, let's trade and see how we do. You're using the heavier shot, you know. All right, yeah. Oh, hurry up. Get to come again. Thurman, turn around. Peter, stop joking. Don't point that gun at me. I'm not joking, Thurman. I'm going to kill you with your own gun. No, Peter, you, you have your mind. You'll never get away with it. Please, Peter, listen to me. You thought I kept my gloves on because I was cold. No, no, Thurman. Only your prince will be on this gun. I'm going to blow your stomach wide open. No, Peter. No. It'll be an accident. No. Now pray, Thurman. Pray. Yes, Peter Drake. In the cold of the morning, you killed a man. Goaded on by the whiplash tongue of the woman you loved, you committed murder. Now, Peter, the plan was finished, complete. The end for you ordained. There was no turning back. Now there are many entries to be made. Soon I will record them all in the Diary of Fate. <laughs> Yes, Peter 
Drake. You were convincing with your story of how Thurman met his death. Only his fingerprints were on the gun. And it substantiated your story of how he held the gun by the barrel while he tapped the loose oarlock with the butt when the gun accidentally discharged. You had seen to it that the marks of the oarlock were on the butt, put there after his death. And it was marked down as another hunting casualty. And you can clearly recall shortly after Thurman was buried when you entered Arthur's office, confident that now your long-scheduled promotion was a certainty. Arthur, why didn't you speak to me before you signed this thing? I could have smelled that trick a mile away. It's only been a month since Thurman's accident and you get us into a jam like this. The point is, I didn't ask you. And I am asking you now. What shall we do? Make me a partner, Arthur, and I can give you all the answers. This isn't the time, Peter. Time? You're hedging, Arthur. You know as well as I do you need me here. I belong here. And the only reason I'm not is because your wife is jealous of Marcia. You shouldn't have said that, Peter. True or not, you shouldn't have said it. If I want your advice again, I'll call you. Good day. But if it's really that serious, Arthur has to give in, Peter. He's cornered. Not quite. He still thinks he can find the answer alone. And if he's not a complete fool, he can. Can't you do something to prevent that? To get him in deeper? Juggle the books, you mean? Not a chance. You've got to do something. We'll never get another opportunity like this. When Thurman died, we got our big breath. If you let this chance slip by without... There's nothing I can do about it, so forget it. There is a way to trap him. There must be. If you weren't such a coward, you'd find it. You dare call me that? What do you know about courage, Marcia? Marcia, this is going to be a shock to you. But do you suppose killing Thurman was easy? (gasps) Peter. Yes, Marcia, I murdered him. Shot him in the belly with his own gun. Now will you shut up and leave me alone? You. Everyone said it was an accident. And all this time... Peter, you've gone this far. You can't stop now. You've got to go ahead. No, Marcia, no, no, please. This is our chance. Work on the book. Ruin Arthur. Trap him. Stop it. Stop it. Stop nagging, pushing, and forcing. In heaven's name, leave me alone and stop goading me. I can't stand anymore. I can't stand anymore, I tell you. Where are you going? Oh, I've got to have time to think. As you left, your mind was a turmoil of frustration. You were afraid to go on and more afraid not to. Then, in a frantic effort to escape your thoughts, you went into a bar. The alcohol was warm inside you, and the churning in your brain quieted and finally stopped. Then you left and went straight to Arthur's house. A light burned in the library. You watched through the French doors as Arthur sealed an envelope, laid it on the mantel. Stealthily, you opened the doors and stepped into the room. Hello, Arthur. Peter, what are you doing sneaking in here at this hour? Why, why, you're drunk. You're working late, Arthur. Are you worried? Yes, I am. I don't know what to do. I do. I know the answer, Arthur, and this is your last chance. I'll tell you if only you'll make me a partner. So that's why you came here. No. Now get out of here. Go on. Get out. Oh, oh no. Not yet, Arthur. What are you doing? Drop that gun. Since when do you keep your gun on the desk? Afraid of burglars, Arthur? Now, Peter, please. Put that gun down. Sit down, Arthur. There at the desk. What are you going to do, Peter? No. No! Now, Peter Drake... You had killed again. You had murdered another man. Then you moved quickly. You wiped the fingerprints. Put the pistol in Arthur's right hand. Pushed his chair close to the desk. And ran from the room. You hurried to your house where you found Marcia asleep. You got into bed at once. And you knew that now, at last, 
you would rule the swirdling empire. Now, Marcia would be happy. You didn't know how long you had slept before you were awakened by Marcia rushing into the room. Peter. Peter, wake up. Have you lost your mind completely? How much do you think you can get away with? Well, what's the matter? Here. Huh? It's all over the morning paper. Listen to this. Arthur Swerdling, dead. President of the Lewis Swerdling Company was found shot to death in the library of his home late last night. Did you do it, Peter? Yes. Yes, I did it. Are you sure nobody saw you? No one saw me. It all happened so fast. I... What about this? Although there was every indication Swerdling killed himself, police were silent about a single clue. Which indicates that someone else may have done a the clue? Case. Oh, no, Marsha. What could it be? Peter, listen to me. You've got to get to the office quick. Make believe that nothing has happened. You didn't see the morning paper. A clue, a clue. If only I could remember. Get hold of yourself. You've got to hurry. Yes, yes. yes. No, I'm so shaky. I'll call a cab while you dress. Hurry. <laughs> As you rode in the taxi to your office, the fatal words drummed over and over in your brain. The police were silent about a single clue. Yes, Peter, they had found something, and the cold terror of what that meant to you made your fingers tremble as you reached for your wallet to pay the cab fare. Then, for an instant... Your heart stopped beating. Your wallet was missing. Frantically, you searched through all your pockets. But it was gone. The awful fact descended over you like a shroud. You ran inside and called Martha. Had her look for it at home. Her voice was heavy with fear. And she told you it was not there. You had to find out. Had to know if your wallet was the clue. You decided to go back to Arthur. And in a few moments later, as the wave of panic mounted inside you, you walked up to his door and pressed the bell. I, uh, I'm Peter Drake. I'd like to see Bertha, uh, uh, Mrs. Swerdling. Were you a friend of Mrs. Swerdling? Yes, a cousin. I'm the treasurer of his firm. Mrs. Swerdling's pretty broken up. She said she didn't want to see anybody. Oh, I understand, of course, yes. May I ask who you are? Lieutenant Fitzsimmons, police department. Oh, I, uh, I read in the paper that you men had found some sort of clue. Uh, do you mind telling me well, what you found? I really couldn't say, Mr. Drake. <laughs> I couldn't go back to the office, Marsha. Look at me. I'm shaking all over. And the police wouldn't tell me a thing. I didn't find your wallet, Peter. I looked everywhere. Huh? Oh, what are we going to do? Think, Peter. When did you have your wallet last? At that bar. I, I, I must have paid for my, my drinks last night. I... Peter. Peter, what's the matter? That man coming up the walk. He's the waiter. The one at the bar. Look at that tall man in back of him. It's the detective. I talked to him at Arthur's. Peter. Sure. Sure, it's simple now. They, they, they must have found my wallet in Arthur's library. They traced my movements. And that waiter, that waiter, he told him what time I left the bar. You can get away. Run, Peter. Off the back. Stall him, will you? Stall him as long as you can. Where are you going? To the bedroom. Come on, go on, answer the door. Mrs. Drake? Yes? I'm Lieutenant Simmons, Police Department. I'd like to talk to your husband in connection with the death of Arthur Swerdling. Yeah, he, uh, he's not feeling well. If you could come back... To the What's that? Peter! Oh, no! Oh! He's dead. <laughs> Killed himself. <laughs> Peter Drake is dead by his own hand, and justice has been served. Although the man is dead, I, fate, have still another entry to make in his record. 
And lest any mortal fail to understand my writing beyond this finality, I will add the reason. In a few moments, I will write again. And when I have written, I will read from the Diary of Fate. <laughs> delicate scales of justice seek their equilibrium, do I, fate, move through the lives of mortals. Only when good has counterweighed evil do I rest. Remember that when the thought is born, the word spoken, the deed performed, the pen indicts. And having been written, the words are indelibly entered in the eternal ledger of the universe. Take heed, you who listen, that your decision be not for evil. For once the decision is made, there is no turning back. And if the decision be for evil, the end for you is certain. In the life of Peter Drake, the plan was set in motion with his decision. And the conclusion was inevitable. For him, self-destruction. Suicide? But why? Because, because he was cornered. Because you came after him for Arthur's murder. What? Yes. And he murdered Thurman, too. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Arthur Swerdling was a suicide. We found the note he left. What note? Arthur Swerdling left a suicide note on the mantel of his room. He confessed juggling the company's books. That's why I'm here. Your husband was the firm's treasurer, and I but, thought that... But the clue. You found a clue. Oh, that was nothing. That turned out to be a false lead. No. No, you're lying. What about the wallet? He lost his wallet. Yeah, yeah, he did that. This man just told me about it down at the door. Yeah, yeah, lady, that's right. You see, he lost it at my bar, and I just wanted to return it. I... I figured it was the honest thing to do. Now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been duly recorded on the pages of eternity. And the sensitive scales of justice are suspended in absolute balance. In the case of Peter Drake, as in the cases of all mortals, I, fate, am but the instrument, the instrument of a plan. And the little things that happen every day, the trivia of life, are the tools with which I work. It was a little thing, the innocent loss of a wallet, which magnified a thousandfold by Peter's complex of guilt, proved his undoing. Ponder well the moral. And remember, you who listen, that there is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. <laughs> Produced by Larry Finley, Diary of Fate is a Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood.
Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Can you predict the future? Can you tell what will come in 100 years? Or in 10? Or in the next minute? Tonight we present two ventures into the unknown. Two fantasies of a future chosen from the works of one of our most brilliant young science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury. First, his story entitled, There Will Come Soft Rains. The house was a good house, planned and built to be lived in in the year 1980. The real estate agent had told them all about it. Now, this is the bedroom. Of course, it contains all the latest devices, self-warming blankets, and uh, yeah, this is a brand new feature. Beds, which make themselves. Now, if you just step this way through the library... We can see the latest in talking book recorders, self-building fireplace, self-cleaning robot dust disposal. Oh, these little mouse-like things come out of the wall and take away all the dirt. Now, over this way. There's a complete robot kitchen, of course. Just set the menu for the week and the stove does the rest. Then there's the automatic hydroponic garden, self-sprinkling fire protection. See, the house is fully automatic. Well, you could go away for a year and it would run itself. And so the family took the house The man and the woman and the two children uh, A boy and a girl And they lived contentedly Enjoying music and poetry and the rich, warm things in life And the house fed them and slept them and entertained them It made a good life for them until one day, there were 10,000 explosions, and the world shook as red fire and ashes and radioactivity fell from the sky. The happy time was over. lay empty. The clock talked to the empty morning. In the kitchen, the stove sighed and ejected from its warm interior eight eggs, sunny side up, twelve bacon slices, two coffees, and two cups of hot cocoa. Seven, nine, breakfast time, come and dine, seven, nine. Today is April 28th, 1985. Today, remember, is Mr. Featherstone's birthday. Insurance, gas, atom heat, and electricity bills are due. 
In the walls, relays clicked. Memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Recorded voices moved beneath steel needles. It's run, run, run. Off to school, off to work. Run, run, tick, stop. Eight o'clock, eight o'clock. But no doors slammed. No carpets took the quick tread of rubber heels. At 8.30, the eggs began to shrivel. An aluminum wedge scraped them into the sink. 9.15, time to clean. 9.15, time to clean. Out of the wall, hundreds of tiny mechanical mice. The rooms were a crawl with small cleaning animals, all rubber and metal. They sucked up the hidden dust and dirt and popped back into their burrows. At ten o'clock, the sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone on a street where all the other houses were rubble and ashes. At night, the ruined town gave off a radioactive glow which could be seen for miles. At 10.15, the garden sprinkler filled the soft morning air with golden fountains. The water tinkled over the charred west side of the house, the side which had been facing the blast. It was black, except in five places. One of the five places was a silhouette of a man mowing a lawn, just as he'd been the instant the radioactivity burned his image into the side of the house. Over there, a woman bent to pick flowers, Still further over, their images burned into the wood where a small boy, hands flung into the air. Higher up, the image of a thrown ball and opposite, a girl, her hands raised to catch a ball which never came down. Five people. Five spots of paint. On the front porch, the dog whined and shivered. The front door recognized the dog's voice and opened. The dog padded in wearily, thin to the bone, covered with sores. It ran to the kitchen and pawed the kitchen door wildly. Behind the door, the stove was making pancakes which filled the house with their odor, as prescribed by the automatic preset menu selector. The dog frogged ran insanely, spun in a circle, biting its tail, and died. One o'clock, one o'clock. Delicately sensing decay, the regiments of mice hummed out of the walls, soft as blown leaves, their electric eyes glowing. One fifteen. The dog was gone. Two fifteen. Bridge tables unfolded from the walls of the patio. Playing cards fluttered onto pads. Martinis appeared on an oaken bench. But the tables were silent. The cards untouched. Five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Dinner was made, ignored, flushed away. Dishes were washed. In the study, the tobacco stand produced a cigar with half an inch of gray ash upon it, smoking, waiting, waiting. The hearth fire bloomed out of nothing. Nine o'clock, nine o'clock. The beds began to warm their hidden circuits, and the phonograph spoke from beside the fireplace. Mrs. McClelland, what poem would you like to hear this evening? Mr. McClelland? Since you express no preference, I shall select at random from among your favorites. Sarah Teasdale. There will come soft rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of war. Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. The phonograph finished the poem. The empty chairs faced each other between the silent walls. 
At ten o'clock that evening, the house began to die. The wind blew the bough of a falling tree into the kitchen window, smashing it. A bottle of cleaning fluid crashed on the stove. Water pumps shot down from the ceiling. But the solvent spread onto the doors, making fire as it went. Other voices in other rooms taking up the alarm. Help! 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 The windows broke with the heat and the wind blew in to help the fire. The fire crackled upstairs at paintings, lay hungrily on the beds, devoured the rooms. The house began to shudder. The bared skeleton began to cringe in the heat. The wires revealed as if a surgeon had torn the skin off. Voices screamed in every room. <laughs> Windows snapped open and shut like undecided mouths. A thousand things were happening at once. Like the interior of a clock shop at midnight, all the clocks were striking, making a merry-go-round of squeaking, whispering, and rushing. In the kitchen, the stove hissing hysterically was making breakfasts at a psychopathic rate. Ten dozen pancakes, six dozen loaves of toast. Then, there was silence. The film spools were burned out. The wires withered and the circuits cracked. Then the house began to breathe its last. The beams began to give at the foundations. Long cracks appeared in the concrete. The seams were burst from the heat. And finally, with a huge rumble, it crashed into dust and rubble. shone faintly in the east. In the ruins of the house, only one wall remained standing. And within the wall, even as the sun rose to shine upon the burning rubble, a voice spoke again and again and again. No one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. 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 Is this how the end will come for mankind? With 10,000 explosions and a flash of radioactive gas? Or will destruction come more subtly, extended to us gently and innocently in, oh, let's say, the hand of a child? Who knows in what manner zero hour may arrest the world we know? <laughs> It was a perfect summer day in the year 1985. The streets were lined with green, peaceful trees. Businessmen sat in their quiet offices, taping their voices or watching televisors. Rockets hovered like darning needles in the blue sky. There was the universal quiet conceit and easiness of men accustomed to peace, quite certain that there would never be war or trouble again. There were no traitors among men, no unhappy ones, no disgruntled ones. The world was upon stable ground. Sunlight illumined the suburbs, and the town drowsed on a tide of warm, sunlit air. On the lawns, the children played, catapulting this way and that across the green grass, shouting at each other, holding hands, flying in circles, climbing trees and laughing. And in the homes, busy mothers prepared for the evening arrival of their husbands. Heavens, Mick, what's all the excitement? We're playing a game, Mommy, the most exciting game ever. What are you doing in that cabinet? I need some tools from Daddy's kit. Mm, your father may not like... Oh, I'll take good care of them, Mom, I promise. Very well. Don't you lose anything. Oh, thank you, Mom. You want a glass of milk? Can't stop now, Mom. What's the name of the game, Ming? Invasion! 
Invasion. What will they think of next? Now this, and this, and this, and this. Now put that there, and to bring that over here. Oh, no, you ninny. Now get back while I fix this. There, they want it this way, see? Here, just let me fix it. Oh, Mink, it's that smarty pants, Joseph Connors. Don't let him play. He's 12 years old. Don't worry, I won't. What you playing, Mink? None of your business, smarty pants. I want to play. Can't. Why not? You're too old. Just because you're only eight. No, you'd only laugh at us and spoil the invasion. Make him go away, Mink. Go away. This is my backyard. Now, who wants to play with you and your old fairies anyway? They aren't fairies. Uh, enough to you. I don't want to play anyway. Good riddance. I'm glad you didn't let him play, Mink. He'd only laugh. Now, we'd better talk to Drill and get some more instructions, Art. Now, here's your pad and pencil. Where is Drill? Drill? Here, Drill. Drill? Well, he's Drill. in the rose bush, I think. I'll talk to him myself and you write it down the pad. Okay. Drill? Drill? Okay. Drill wants you to write down triangle. What's a triangle? Never mind. Drill will tell us when he wants us to know. It helps the invasion. How do you spell it? Hmm. Well, that's Drill. Drill, how do you Mink. spell... Here's your mother, looking out the window. Me? Yes, mother? Who are you talking to? The rose bush, Mom. Only it's not really a rose bush. That's Drill. Who's Drill? He's planning the invasion. Oh, I see. Well, you better come in and clean up for supper. Your daddy will be home soon. In just a second, Mom. You got that, Art? See, now what? Four, nine, seven, and A, and B, and X, and a fork, and some string, and a, and a hexagony, hexagonal droopy. Come oh. on, Mink. Supper's in ten minutes. Okay, Mom. Just a minute. I have to tell Drill. I wish we didn't have to eat, though. It holds up the invasion. <laughs> Sake, slow down. You'll choke on that soup. I can't. Mom. It's a matter of life and death. What's a matter of life and death? The invasion. What invasion is that? Oh, just some silly game the children have been playing. Well, whatever it is, Mink, it'll wait until you've finished your supper, I'm sure. Well, I don't want any more. You've barely touched anything. Oh, but Drill is waiting for me, Daddy. Drill? Who's Drill? He lives in a rose bush in our backyard. Imagination, Henry. Oh, such nonsense. I've got to run now. You'll sit through dessert, young lady. Oh, gee, Daddy. And while you're at it, tell me more about this new game. It's Martians invading Earth, Daddy. What? Well, we're not exactly Martians, Daddy. They're from... Well, gee, I don't know, from... Oh. And from inside that little head of yours. You're laughing at me. Drill said you would. You'll kill Drill and... And everybody. Oh, I didn't know you could kill a Martian. But it, it's not really a Martian, Mom. Maybe it's from Jupiter or Venus, even. <laughs> Imagine. They couldn't figure out a way to attack the Earth. We are impregnable. Impregnable, dear. Well, that's the word Drill said, impreg... Well, anyway, that was the word, Mom, the same word. Anyway, so we're helping them. Now, who's helping who? Well, the kids are helping the Martians. Well, oh, fifth column, eh? Well, Drill says in order to make a good fight, you've got to have a new way of surprising the people. That way you win... And he says, also, you got to have help from your enemy. Pretty slick, those Martians, using the kids for a fifth column, eh, Mary? And hiding under rose bushes, too, Henry. Don't forget that. Well, that's because grown-ups never look under rose bushes. Only kids. Oh, I see. Well, finish your fruit, darling. You can play for an hour afterward. Mary. Oh, it's so nice out, Henry, and there's no school tomorrow. Very well. Till 8 o'clock. Trill says after the invasion, we can stay up as late as we want. No more bats, either. Oh, is that so? You can watch all the grown-up televisor shows. I don't wonder this invasion has caught on among the kids. Well, some of the kids are giving us trouble, like like Dale Britz and Petey Jarek. They're growing up, so they won't believe in the invasion. They make fun. Worse than parents, even. I hate them worst. We'll kill them first. I hope you're saving your father and me for last. But Drill says you're dangerous. What? But I... 
I think they'll let me keep you because I'm helping so much. I'll talk to Drill. Maybe we won't have to kill you. Mary, I think this nonsense has gone far enough. Can I go out now, please? Well, run along, dear. Don't worry, Dad. I won't let them hurt you. Mary, I think the child's taking this game entirely too seriously. Invasion. Now, oh, Henry, you know how Mink is. Besides, all children have their aggressions. Better to get them out in the open, I suppose. Maybe you're right. Um, I was wondering about bridge with the Jacksons tonight, Mary. All right. But, uh, you look tired, dear. Why don't you sit in the relaxer for a while and get a massage? I'll sew for a while until it's time to... Oh, I wanted to call my sister Helen. Oh, good. Find out when her husband's going to return my golf clubs. <laughs> Would you please connect me with Mrs. Helen Rogerson on Channel 7, 2Z, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What is your channel, please? 817X, New Rochelle, New York. Thank you. Just a moment. Go ahead. You can see your party now. Hello, Mary. How are things in New York? Fine, Helen. How are things in Pittsburgh? You look tired. Oh, I've been having a terrible time with the children. Sick? No, just underfoot. They've got a new game that's got me just about crazy. It's called Invasion. Did you say Invasion? That's right. Well, isn't that strange? My mink is playing it, too. My boy Tim is all involved with some imaginary fellow named Drill who's running the Invasion. Must be a new password. Mink likes him, too. How do you suppose these games start? My backyard looks like a scrap drive. They've got every conceivable kind of mechanical gadget arranged out there. I talked to Josephine Schiller in Boston, and she says her kids are wild about it, too. It's sweeping the country. Remember when it was the Roomba? Please, dear, I'm not that old. Mommy! Oh, please, Minky, I'm on the televisor. Come on, see your Aunt Helen. Hello, Ming. Hi, Aunt Helen. Look what I've got. What is it, honey? Well, it's the yo-yo. Look what I enroll it. See? Well, Helen, look, it vanished. Where did it go? Into another dim... Dim, dim. <laughs> she means dimension. I'll uh-huh. say the darn thing. My Timmy brought one home, too. I can't figure out how they work. Make it reappear, honey. There. It's easy. Oh, where'd you get it, dear? Jill gave it to me, Mom. Mink? Bye, Aunt Helen. Gotta run now. Mink, you come back here. I want to talk to you. Hands off zero hour. It's five o'clock. Mink. Bye. Oh, I can't understand it. The child's never been so unruly. Helen... Do you suppose that... What? Oh, nothing. Just a wild thought that... Say, the reason I called, I want to get that black and white cake recipe. And Henry wants his golf clubs. I don't know what he'll... do. What was that? Oh, I, I don't know. One of the children must have been hurt. I'll have to run and see. Call me back tonight, will you? All right, Mary. Bye. Me? Come here. Yes, Mom. What is it? Who screamed? Peggy Ann. All right, what happened? Well, she got scared and went home. Did you hit her? Uh, no, she just got scared. She's a scared baby anyway. We won't let her play anymore. She's getting too old. Mm. Now, Mink, tell me why she cried. Uh, no, I can't. Mink, you'll answer me this instant or come inside. I've had enough of this nonsense. Oh, gee, I can't quit now, Mom. It's almost zero hour. Then tell me what frightened Peggy Ann. Okay, she saw Drill. Drill? He almost came through. He was just testing. Through what? Well, those pipes and things we set up. She looked into one of the pipes and screamed. I guess she saw Drill. And no one hit her? Uh Uh-uh. Very well, Mink. I'll call Peggy Ann's mother and see how she is. And I'll call you for your bath in half an hour. Your father and I want to go out tonight. You won't be able to go out, Mom. Why not? Zero hours, five o'clock, Mom. Hello, dear. Oh, you home already, Henry? Yes, I thought I'd relax a little before we went to the theater. Where's the little one? Out back. Same game? Same game. 
They've got a stack of pipes and hammers and spoons a mile high out there. Children, children, why do we have them? They are strange little creatures, aren't they? Even Mink, Henry. She's a part of us, and... And yet, what do we really know about how she thinks and feels? Well, I didn't mean to start a philosophic discussion. Kids are such a queer mixture of love and hate, though. Even normal, healthy kids. They need you, and they're dependent on you, and yet they resent that dependence. You sound like a child psychology course I once took. I wonder if they ever really forgive the whippings and the commands we have to give them sometimes. I wonder if we ever forgot them when we were children. Look, I'd like to discuss this with you, dear, but we do have a theater date, and it's almost five o'clock now. What's happened to the kids? They're so quiet. When children are quiet, you know there's some mischief. What's that sound? I don't know. Those kids aren't playing with anything electrical, are they? I'm sure they are. At least I Just the same. I'd better go out. Henry. See. Tell them to put off the invasion. What? Mary, don't get upset. It's just a game. Good Lord, what's that? Look out the window, Mary. Oh. What is it? Where are the children? Mary, why are you shaking? What did you see? Henry, quick, up to the attic. They aren't in the attic. Yes, yes, the attic. Quick. Mary! Come back here. Mary! Mary, don't go up. They aren't up there. Mary, you out of your mind? There's no one up here. We shut the door. Lock it. Lock it. But there's nothing up here. What, what is wrong with you? Mary, come to your senses. Henry. What are you talking about? I saw it. Through the window, Henry. It was horrible. What? <laughs> For heaven's sake, let's get down out of this attic and talk this over sensibly. I, I want to find out if Mink is all right. Oh, she's all right. I saw her. She was leading them around the corner of the house. Leading who? Oh, the kids? It's nothing. Oh, listen. Listen. Huh? The front door. Those, those kids sound like 50 men with, with boots on. Oh, no, not men. Oh, huh? please, God, don't let them find us. Don't let them find us. I, I don't understand. Who's there? Shh, don't shout down here. Who's down there? I demand that you answer me. Save her. Henry, you don't understand. She's leading them. What? She's leading them. She's on their side. Oh, please, God, forgive me. The children on their side? Oh, she told us, but, but we wouldn't believe her. Henry, they're coming out! Mom? Dad, we know you're in there. Well, I guess you better melt the lock, Henry, the lock! It's melting! The dog! Oh, dear God! Mom? Dad? Oh, I see you now. Pick a ball! <laughs> have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Next week, Destination Moon. A preview of the movie which is soon to have its world premiere in New York. Telling the Robert Heinlein story of man's first trip to the moon. <laughs> 
night's adventures in Dimension X, there will come Soft Rains and Zero Hour were written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by George Leffert. Featured in the first story as narrator was your host, Norman Rose. The leading players in Zero Hour were Denise Alexander as Mink and Rita Lynn as the mother, Roger DeCoven as the father. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Don Abbott. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Robert Warren speaking. Programs, get your programs here. For a new thrill in detective listening, join the saint tomorrow as he reaps a harvest of criminals in a thrilling adventure with the underworld. Make the saint a Sunday listening habit and keep tuned thereafter for adventures of the greatest detective of them all, Sam Spade. Tomorrow, hear High Adventure, now Truth or Consequences on NBC. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. I'll just take that parcel from you, Mr. Santini. Hungry. Back up against that wall. <clears throat> now we'll just have a look at what we're all really after. What? Why, this ain't the right stuff. This is nothing but plain old swamp grass. <laughs> Here comes Monk Mayfair, the ape like chemist. Blazes! Ham Brooks, the sword wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated! And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the man of bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, The Disappointing Parcel, Chapter 3 of the fantastic story, Fear Key. The mysterious business of Fountain of Youth Incorporated has caused the death of a banker named Thackeray Hutchinson who claimed the Fountain of Youth possessed a secret for which the wealthiest men in America would each pay a million dollars. After unsuccessfully attempting to kidnap Doc Savage, the Fountain of Youth gang headed by a man named Santini attempts to waylay Kel Avery who is due in New York on a plane from Florida. Also interested in Kel Avery is one Dan Thunden a spry old man who claims to be 131 years old. When Doc, his five assistants, and cousin Pat Savage attempt to foil the airport plot, they are tricked away from the plane by a ruse, only to find that a motion picture starlet named Maureen Darling has been grabbed by the Santini gang. Upon questioning the movie star's bodyguard, Doc and his aides are startled to hear that Maureen Darling is Kel Avery. <laughs> Maureen Darling and Kel Avery are the same person? Yes, Kel Avery or Kelmina Avery. She don't use that name not so much. The name Avery's 
She's not so good on the uh, movie picture, no? Marlene Darling, much better. So the girl, she used the name of Avery, not so much. And you're her bodyguard. Yes, my name is Klima. Well, you may be built almost as well as Doc Savage here, but you're sure a flop in the bodyguard business. Doc! What is it, Johnny? Your cousin Pat isn't around here any place. Rennie, you said Santini's gang made off with two women? Right, Doc. The cleaner. Did Miss Avery have any female traveling companions? No, just the cleaner. Then the second woman must have been Pat. Come on. The cleaner? He go along? How about that, Doc? Of course. We want to ask him some questions. So we catch them, and the cleaner, he break them into little pieces. Witnesses said the gang hustled the two women into a blue phaeton and headed toward New York. Hit it, Rennie. Now, De Klima, what do you know about all this? Me? I not know so much. Well, tell us what you do know. Yesterday, I read about it in the papers. The kidnap what is tried on Marine Darling in East Florida. Call her Miss Avery, so there'll be no confusion. Ah, yes. I'm in East Florida, then. I go to her, to Miss Avery. I am once a fighter, not so hot. And now, the nick, I pick up where I can. I fight, I shoot. Uh, I'm plenty the tough guy, I may. Don't brag. You're with guys who are tough now. But you are not so good in the head, no? You run to the wrong fight while them fellas, they get Marine Darling. Uh, me saver. Say, you funny-talking bundle of beef. Are you hunting a slap? Stop it, Monk. The cleaner, you went to Miss Avery after you heard of the attempt to kidnap her. You offered your services as a bodyguard? That's her. That's the idea. I put up the talk and tell her that me, I am the one she needs. So she hired me to watch out for her. Ha! <laughs> Fine job you got. What else do you know? Me, nothing. You know nothing about Santini, Pallet, and Leaking. Or a white-bearded man named Dan Fundam, who claims he's 131 years old? Or a company which calls itself Fountain of Youth, Incorporated? No, I've never heard of any of them, no. <laughs> what an information mine you turn out to be. The claimer, he not like you, not... Brother, the affection is retained. Look, up ahead. In a ditch by the road. A woman! I say, quite disheveled, swabbed in mud at roadside grind. She's coming over. Say, even with all that mud, she's a dish. It is Marine, Miss Avery. Are any of you Doc Savage? I am. Good. Keep going. Well, step on it. Now, Miss Avery, what happened? They threw me out. After they went to all that trouble to seize you? They thought I was my maid. And the other girl made them think she was Kel Avery. What other the girl? The one who rushed to my side when the trouble started back at the airport. She acted as if she was one of my party and made them think she was me. When she got the chance, she whispered to me to begin to scream. And they might throw me out of the car. Then she said if they did, Doc Savage would be following and I should tell him my story. So I screamed and they threw me out. What did this other girl look like, Miss Avery? She was beautiful. She had bronze-colored hair, just like yours, Mr. Savage. So it was, Pat. I was coming to New York to get your help. Did you tell anyone that? Nobody. Why? Because Santini and his outfit learned you were coming to me and tried to kidnap me and put me where you couldn't find me. Or that's how it seems. Santini? Ever hear of him? No. Or Fountain of Youth Incorporated? No. What about Hallett or Leaking? Never heard those names that I recall. What about a white-haired man named Dan Funden who says he's 131 years old? Oh. So you have heard of Dan Funden? Yes. He's my great-grandfather, according to the letter I got from him. My great-grandfather on my mother's side, the letter said. What else did his letter say? It said for me to take the package that was with the letter and guard it with my life, to be sure not to open it, and to come to Florida, and I would be worth $50 million within 30 days. Holy cow. You obeyed instructions? It sounds silly, but I did. You see, the press agent for the movie company I worked for thought it would be a good idea to get some newspaper space. The company even paid me a salary to go to Florida as instructed. The press agent was going to meet me there, but before he came, I was kidnapped. Was that the press agent's idea, Miss Avery? The press agent doesn't even know where I am. He hadn't even gotten to Florida. I was scared. Those men threatened to kill me unless I got the package. How did you extricate yourself? As a matter of fact, I didn't escape. They turned me loose to get the parcel, but instead I came north. Why come north? to put the thing in your hands. Where is the parcel now? In the plane on which I arrived, back at the airport. I sent it by airmail, knowing it would come on the same plane. Why that precaution? I was afraid to carry it. 
Maybe I'm not very brave. You're brave enough. How about it, Rennie? Have we caught up the Santini's car yet? Uh, it's no use, Doc. They've given us the slip. Should we head back to the office? Yes. Perhaps some research in our library will shed some light on all this. That old Yahoo Dan Thunder is sure a lick splitting freak. <laughs> Imagine a king, 131 years old, being able to hop around like he can. If he is indeed that old. We have only his word for it, Monk. This is some office. How high up are we? 86th floor, Miss Avery. Doc's private high-speed elevator makes the trip seem short, though. Long Tom, Ray, Johnny, Ham, here are the addresses of some of the wealthy men whose names were in that file in the Fountain of Youth office. Their names were there for some reason, just like the bankers, Thackeray Hutchinson. Go investigate them. Okay. Some of these birds should give us information. But be careful. We don't want a repetition of what happened to Thackeray Hutchinson. Yeah, that guy got what was coming to him. What happened to him? He got shot between the eyes. Oh. What about Pat, Doc? We haven't a lead to go on, Rennie. We'll have to see what turns up. Now get going. Uh, me, I think I go out. Uh, not for long. Why, De Clima? Business. Very well. Monk. Yeah, Doc. Follow the clean off. With pleasure. And boy, do I hope this guy gives me some excuse to tie into him. Mr. Savage, you don't trust the Klima. Just a precaution, Miss Avery. And it gives Monk something to do. He feels neglected if he isn't doing something. You have a remarkable group of men. Now for you. It isn't advisable for you to leave here, since Santini and his crew must know about this office. You can use the telephone and have fresh clothes sent up from a shop. There's an excellent one in the building. Thank you. I assume you made arrangements for my airmail package to be delivered here? It'll be here in not more than 20 minutes. The claimer, he get two new ones, see? My other two ones, them fella at the airport, they got... Bought two new revolvers, hmm? They aren't easy to purchase here in New York. Well, for the fellow with the money, anything she easy. At a hawk shop, I get them. And I no need license for to carry them, either. Here's the newspapers you wanted, Doc. The monk went into a hawk shop, stayed a while, and came back here. He didn't do nothing else. Call the police, monk. Have them have that pawnbroker's business license taken away for selling firearms to unlicensed people. Right. Any word from Pat? None. I'm worried about that other girl, Pat. What do you think they're doing to her? Uh, probably trying to buffalo her into telling her where the box your great-granddaddy Dan Thunden sent you can be found. I'd give up that box in an instant if it would get her freedom. Mailmen with the box should be here shortly. An armored truck is pulling up in front of the building, Doc. It must be bringing the package. You told them to use an armored truck? Of course. Uh-oh. Something's happening down there. What? Come, Look. Postal carriers are heading toward the front of the building, but three guys are standing up in the, that open touring car nearby. They're throwing something at the postal carriers. They look like glass bottles. Look, they're, they're breaking, and the postmen are falling down. Yes! One of the men in the touring car is heading toward the postman. He must be holding his breath. Doc, can't we do something? We'd never get down there in time, Monk. The man grabbed the package. Now he's running back toward the touring car, and it's taking off. There goes the package. Oh, them damn fellas, they sure smart guys. I go after them. Wait. I, I could hit him with my super machine pistol. No, Monk. Doc, have you gone nuts? Wait a minute. You pulled a fast one. What was it? Have a look. Down there. Say, it's not... It's Johnny's tube weaving in and out of traffic. But I thought you sent him to interview those wealthy men. The slip of paper I gave him actually told him to tail the mail truck. If anything happened, he was to use his own judgment. Will this lead us to Pat? Let's hope so, Monk. Meanwhile, let's go down to the garage. Mm, this truck, she's some buggy. Bulletproof glass and armor plate, yes. Right, and the tires are filled with sponge rubber instead of air, so they can't be shot out. But it looks like an ordinary delivery truck. Yes, Santini and his gang will be less likely to recognize us than if we use one of my usual cars. Isn't it about time to get Johnny on the short wave? Yes, Monk. 
you can contact your men from this truck. Yeah. Everybody's tied in with two-way radio sense. And we can all talk together if we want. Johnny, come in. Right here, Doc. Where are you? Uh, going north on Broadway. So far, there's been no difficulty. Have they seen you? Emphatically negative. Johnny means no. Deviating eastward over the bridge to Long Island. What's going on here? That you, Rennie? Right. I just turned on my set. Santini has stolen Miss Avery's package from the mail carriers. Johnny's tailing them. Head for Long Island and join him. Meanwhile, what did you learn when you interviewed your rich man? My rich man has flown the coop, Doc. According to his maid, he got a telephone call a little while before I arrived. He acted excited, grabbed some money out of his private safe, snatched a few clothes, and jammed them into a suitcase. Then ran out the door. That's the last they saw him. Sounds like he was tipped off you were coming. You said it. The men who appropriated the package are now traversing an unpopulated section of Beach Road, Doc. Be careful they don't see you, Johnny. You're cautioning me? Doc, it's obvious Santini's gang warned the rich men to skip out. But what puzzles me is what got him to beat it so fast. It's not so strange, Rennie. The newspapers are on the street with the news of Thackeray Hutchinson's death. Fear of a similar fate is enough to cause those wealthy men to do what they're told. Santini's sure taking plenty of trouble to keep us from learning what this is all about. Whatever it is, it must be big. Doc, the car is stopped on an old road near the beach. They're getting out. Where are you stopped, Johnny? Uh, about 15 miles beyond the highway junction. You've been traveling faster than it seemed. It'll take us 15 or 20 minutes to get there. I'm going to trail them on foot. Do that, and watch your step. The way them mail carriers caved in. Sweet, I call it. That won't be sweet if they broke me. Don't worry, Shorty. Gas just made him senseless for a while. Where's Santini? Over in that shack. Would have rested a mob. What's a shack doing here? There ain't even summer cabins this far out. Yeah, it's pretty remote, all right. Come on. Who is he? Santa Claus. What do you think? Did you get it? Sure, Santini. We got it. Bueno, give it to me. Say, what happened to your chin, Santini? You're all cut. Ah, uh, that girl is a cat. I thought I had her tied securely in the corner there, but she kicked me in the face and almost got away. Now come, we open this package. Pat, I gotta tell Doc about this. Unless you're bulletproof, you better stand right where you are. Funding. Right you are, and I know all about your bulletproof vest. So don't try anything, or I'll shoot you in the head. So you are working with them? No, sir. I'm working on them, not for them. Then you and I had better work together. Old Dan Thunden is working for himself. I didn't know who you was when I met you before, but now I know you're one of Doc Savage's outfit, and I don't want any part of you. Listen, what we have no to do... more jawboning. We are just gonna do some watching and listening. Veramente, look all of you. This is it. This is what we search for. And that old Gotondo and even sent his great granddaughter a map of showing the island's whereabouts. You sure it's the island? See, si. here it is. In the Caribbean, 500 miles from Florida, and out of the sea routes of any modern ship. So, now that we have the package, what do we do with the girl? We no longer need her. Shoot her! Life won't make as much noise. Very well, just get it done. Quick, get into the shack before they harm my granddaughter. Ready? I suppose... Couldn't miss you all from here. Thunder! <laughs> Up against the wall there, all of you. You too, little John. <laughs> now, I'll just take that map. I never should have sent that to my great granddaughter, but I didn't know but that we might find use for it. I guess all concerned can find the island if need be, except Doc Savage and his scuts, and we don't want them in on it. Now, Shall we all have a look at what we're really after? What? Why, this ain't... Grab him! Go! 
Even you and the Doc Savage is a man or no match for my men, eh, Thumbden? Maybe. But take another look in the box, Santini. You haven't got what you think you got. What do you mean? <laughs> that ain't the stuff. It's just plain old swamp grass. <laughs> swamp grass? Licking, give me the box. He's right. This isn't the stuff. What have you done with the weeds, Sunday? Uh, this here gal must have made a change. What did you do with that package I sent you? Miss Avery, don't tell them a thing. But whatever you do, don't tell them a thing. Silence! Leaking! Untie her and see what she has to say. Right. Hey, hey where'd she get that gun? <laughs> Exquisite. You completely overlooked the firearm Mr. Thunden dropped in the melee, Santini. Now I'll just remove this young lady's gag and restraints. <coughs> oh... Well, I came to New York for excitement. Man, oh, man, am I getting it. Now, Thunden, why did you mail that package? Why, well, I needed money. I was going to meet you in Florida and tell you the whole story, but these gentlemen must have got the telegram you sent telling me you would go to Florida. Or did you send such a message? The message was sent. I never got it. Now, that explains why I did not meet you in Florida. Did Santini send a man down there? No more! Forget him. I shoot him many times in the heart. He is a dead. Boss, I move. We shake this place. Things are getting too tough. The skinny guy you shot is one of Doc Savage's outfit. So let me tell. Savage will move the earth to get the guys who rubbed out one of his friends. Shorty's right. Kidnapping the bronze guy was one thing. Killing one of his men is another. In the U.S. is going to be too warm for us. <laughs> you birds are just getting wise to yourselves. Shut her up. So what do we do now? I have it. Buena, an excellent idea. I hope so. It is the one great idea I have. We will take the seaplane and go to the island. Doing that, we will be away from this dark savage. We will get a supply of the weeds and operate from outside of the country. What about the girl? We take her along. She is the one who knows where the other box is. We make her tell where that parcel goes to. If we do not find what we want on the island, then the girl will be very valuable indeed. We will have her to trade for it. Yeah, not a bad idea. Oh, boss. See, what is eating you? When we reach the asylum and find a storeroom, do we get to use the stuff ourselves? Well, of course. See, see. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I feel like a guy who's just been promised a million bucks. No, everyone, quickly. To the seaplane. We must make our escape before Doc Savage finds out about this. Bring the girl. We are off for fear key. <laughs> Will Santini make good his escape? What has happened to the spry old Dan Thunden? And what steps will Doc Savage take to avenge the murder of his aide Johnny? Don't miss Island of Death, Chapter 4 of Fear Key, next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. <laughs> Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Bill Ratner, Kemet Mustin, Robin Riker, Marcia Kramer, Bob Farley, Michael McConaughey, Douglas Kohler, William Irwin, and Glenn Shaddock. Also heard was Bob Lyon. Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King.
Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Rittner and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio